Good morning, everybody. Can I welcome you to the 17th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee uh, in 2015? And can I remind everybody to make sure that all electronic devices are switched off at all times? The first item is for us to decide whether to take items 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 in private. Is that agreed? That's agreed. Thank you. Our next item is to continue our evidence taking on the Education Scotland Bill. We will take evidence today from three panels of witnesses. And can I welcome to the first panel uh, Bruce Robertson, OBE, and John Stodter, Association of Directors of Education in Scotland. Uh, good morning. And Councillor Michael Cook and Robert Nickel, Nickel both from COSLA. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, uh, before I move straight to questions, can I, uh, we are got a very uh, busy <laughs> um, uh, schedule this morning. Um, I, given you're both representing the same organisations, could I ask one of you? to answer for that organisation rather than both of you answering for uh, the organisation. So when a question is asked, if it's a COSLA representative or an ADIS representative ask, answering the question, that would be appreciated to try and uh, minimise the amount of time that we have to uh, uh, take up on the questions. Um, I'm going to move straight to questions now. I, I'm going to bring, begin the session with George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd just like to ask uh, initially about the attainment part of the bill in particular. I've been reading uh, all the evidence, obviously, and the causal submission is quite negative towards the bill in itself, uh, in so much that uh, I would probably say it's very negative with regards to it. Now, my, question, my initial question would be to COSLA. Uh, you know, is there not an issue with attainment and uh, is everything that's happening within your organisations and local government perfect and going forward? And is there not a need to actually be able to push this, uh, ideal, these ideals forward? Clearly, the world isn't per perfect. Um, in terms of recognising the importance of attainment as a proposition, that's something that local authorities will understand. There was um, a, an organised day recently... Um, at the beginning of June, where local authorities gathered together to consider precisely this issue, something they've been engaged in many years. At the same time, you have a bill which has been in development here, which originally started its consultation back in 2014, contained no proposition with regard to attainment at that time, and lo and behold, in January of this year, it was proposed that attainment should be included. Unfortunately, that gives a sense that this is a rather hurried proposition. It's over hasty, it's not been adequately consulted on, and the result is it looks like it's been parachuted into the bill at last moment. That, I think, is unfortunate. A much more engaged and consultative approach with regard to how we collectively, across national government and local government, deal with the question of attainment would have been much more appropriate. I can say, in terms of my own local authority, I'm in no doubt where... The, the real interest is, um, like every authority in the land, I want to see that um, attainment gap in respect of deprivation closed. We're well apprised of that. It's something that we want to push forward. I recognise that Scottish Government wants to do also. Let's have a proper conversation about it rather than doing something that's half-baked and half-hearted. OK, then, uh, Councillor Cook, you say that uh, it's an issue that's been growing, ongoing for many years, and that's true. In my own constituency, Fergusley Park is the biggest area of deprivation in no, certain parts of it in the whole of Scotland. But it has been since my father was born there in the 1940s. You know, so we have to, there has to be a situation where we all work together to try and get to that stage. Now, this has been a commitment of the Scottish Government to try and say that there is an issue with attainment and we have to deliver it. Now, everything that COSLA has put down in their report has been more or less saying that you guys are dealing with it and uh, you're working with it and you don't need anyone else to kind of work with you to do it. You know, is it not the case that we should be pushing this forward and trying to? Well, if we're talking about an area like Ferguson Park and Paisley that's been like that since the 1940s and attainment has been very similar, should we not be moving forward? Just to you, by way of first response, that clearly those deep-seated problems have got more than to do with simply education. There's a whole range of issues which, which speak to the fact that there's that deprivation gap. Um, so it, it needs a considered and it needs a holistic approach. And what I've said to you already is that, unfortunately, 
the way the bill has been constructed and consulted on is not reflective of that kind of approach. It would have been much more appropriate had there been a detailed consideration, a proper consultation on the question of attainment, and together, and this is really the fundamental proposition, Scottish Government and local government might have con constructed something purposeful which really does begin to deliver in terms of dealing with this issue. But as I say to you, this is not merely an education proposition. It's much broader and more fundamental than that. It engages uh, departments across local authorities and it engages a range of departments across government as well. I agree with that, uh, Councillor Cook, but uh, one of the things, coming from a local government background myself, um, I'm fully aware uh, that uh, no matter, it tends to be of recent times, no matter what the government says, Cosley just says no at this stage, no, are we not getting to a stage where we have to actually kind of say, you know, there's constant, this could be very similar to a submission made by COSLA from other uh, things that they've put forward as well. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I think that's just a misreading of the position. I'm not here to be a partisan. Our responsibility is to look at the propositions as they're put in front of us and then to make a sober judgment about that. Now, the fact is, you know, this isn't simply us shooting from the hip coming to you because, ah, it's Scottish Government, therefore we don't like that. What happens here is there's the most uh, profound consultation within local government as to what our collective response should be. And actually, what you'll find for the most part, I suspect, is that ADES colleagues who have professional expertise of generations of experience in education broadly agree with us about some of the um, problems with this proposition and the bill in general. Uh, uh, that brings me to ADES as well, because on the whole, ADES seems to be a wee bit more positive towards uh, the bill as is. And I was wondering if uh, what we've already discussed, is there anything, uh, Bruce, that you could maybe uh, chip in at this point? Well, I, I, I would start with, with the, thing, the fact that this is the most challenging phenomenon in Scottish education uh, and has been for generations, as you, as you said yourself. Uh, statistics do demonstrate that if you're a child in Fergus Lee Park, you actually start school at a great disadvantage, uh, possibly as much as 18 months behind some of your peers in other parts of Scotland. So I think it does need the system, and that system is about this parliament, about Scottish government, local government, the professionals, uh, and all those supporters of education, actually, to get behind this and try and address this huge challenge. Because there's far too much of a correlation between where a child lives is brought up and how well that child will do and is likely to do in education and obviously thereafter eh, as, they, as they progress through life. So that's why ADES is very supportive uh, of, of a system-led approach to uh, address attainment and achievement in, in education. Uh, it's something that this country must coalesce around. Uh, so that's a, 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 I'm looking for a partnership, a genuine partnership to address this. Will a piece of legislation on its own do that? No. Uh, but it's a very imp important component, uh, we, we would suggest. Uh, and the legislation has, su has some way to go. Uh, and the uh, very well-crafted statutory guidance, which actually outlines for the education authorities, the, the, lo the local councils, and indeed national government in terms of what their responsibilities are therein as well. Uh, key to this, obviously, is what happens in the classroom. We need to have the best quality teachers, high quality teaching and learning in the classrooms, and the best leaders in Scottish schools. That's what makes a difference in terms of raising attainment and breaking that gap between where you live and how well you, you'll, you'll do. So excellent teaching, outstanding leadership. And the system, the Scottish education system and the expertise in that system begin to pre prepare a national improvement framework that, again, we can agree to take forward uh, over the next few years. So ADES is very much supportive uh, of any moves to break this gap between attainment and where you live in Scotland. Uh, one of the interesting points uh, you bring up is one that's constantly come up in evidence uh, has been the fact that uh, leadership in, head, uh, in uh, schools is, uh, obviously makes all the difference. But uh, some of the evidence we've received has been it's, it can be pretty patchy in areas. So how, would we, how, how can we get to a situation where we can uh, you know, the, make sure that uh, that is the norm? You know, we've got uh, these, these community leaders almost uh, working from the schools everywhere. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, like everything else in life, you can have variations, and we do know that where there's uh, excellent leadership, uh, where that leader is seen as being a leader in his or her community, 
uh, nudge us within the narrow confines of the school, then that make all the difference. As Councillor Cook has outlined, uh, this isn't just an education issue. It's an issue that we, we, we need Scottish society to, to embrace. And that's why, in terms of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, I would expect in the seven authorities who are, are, are uh, if you like, leading the way on this, have been selected, I would expect them not just to have education plans, but have plans that would actually help the, the development of young people. If you, for example, if you, if you come to school hungry in the morning, you're not likely to attain of your best. So we'd be looking for breakfast clubs. If you, if, 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 if you've, if you've no support during the school holidays, if you've no support after school, eh, then you're not likely to attain of your best. Uh, we need to have some positive interventions in young people's lives out with the school. And that's why a school leader needs to be able to emb embrace all that. We've got a number of uh, programmes in place uh, for the development of, uh, of, of excellent leaders in our schools. The new Scottish College for Educational Leadership is, is absolutely thorough to, to this priority and has been involved in, in discussions with ADES on this. Uh, and, you know, we've got a number of different networks working. So the quality of leadership, absolutely. Can it be increased? Yes, it can. Can that be done overnight? No, it can't. We need to actually be to develop that and take a number of years to it. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Scanlon. Thank you. Um, can I, the, the first uh, sentence in uh, the bill itself says um, this act of the Scottish Parliament to impose duties in relation to reducing pupils' inequalities of outcome. Um, I, I wonder if uh, you could uh, help me in pointing to the parts of the bill that uh, reduce pupils' inequalities of outcome. Mr Cook, you look like you're... I do, I'm not the sponsor of the bill, clearly. I, I... Looking for your advice because I'm finding it difficult. Well, uh, I, I, I suppose I'm reflecting that back to you, aren't I? Um, it, I'm not the sponsor of the bill. I, I think if there had been, as I suggested, in response to earlier questions, a more considered approach to how we might um, respond collectively to the matter of attainment, then clearly the bill would have been constructed in a slightly different way. And I think the difficulty which you perhaps are hinting at is... The, what you've got is a duty here which sits in isolation. It doesn't appear to relate to anything else. And that, I, th I think, as we're intimating to you, really both from the ADES perspective and also from the COSLAS perspective, is a clear limitation in what's envisaged here. And it is reflective, I think, as, as I was alluding to earlier, to the fact that this seems to have been something which has been added later to the bill. Um, originally, when the consultation started off in relation to this, it was a bill conceived as dealing principally with Gaelic education. Um, clearly, it's, it's transformed itself over the course of time and it betrays limitations as a consequence of that. So, are you saying to me that there are um, some limits to, to, with regard to the proposition as it's currently drafted in the bill? Yes, I, I think I'm saying I agree with that. Well, I, I, I'm not saying anything to you. I'm, I'm seeking your help and guidance well. uh, here. So can, can I perhaps just move on? Uh, we are where we are with the bill, and uh, you know the, the whole raison d'etre is to look at pupils' inequalities and reduce the attainment gap. So perhaps I could ask the question in a different way. Um, I'm also on the audit committee, and I'm aware that 27 out of 32 local authorities buy in private tests from England. Um, so should we have a form of uh, national, national testing. Uh, I think it was Sue Ellis said, we need a bank of tests and surveys that schools can call on. And Professor Lindsay Patterson last week in TESS wrote, testing's not alien to the culture of Scottish teaching or Scottish professionalism. I mean, should we make sure that, you know, children, particularly in primary school, and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have both uh, acknowledged that we don't have enough information about children in primary school, school where they are likely to fall behind and need that support. So can I ask it in perhaps a hopefully more positive way, do we need a form of testing, a national performance framework? Do we need standardised national tests? Would that address what the bill is setting out to do? Um, I, 
In terms of what we heard on the 5th of June at this, uh, this attainment day where local government was getting together, um, actually, what we learned is, and I mean, I, I think most of us knew this, is we're not data poor, that we have a broad sweep of information in relation to... Um, it, well, I, I think there is increased consistency, and the point you've made yourself, actually, is that local authorities, many of them buy in a very similar system from England, so they are using that kind of approach. There is increasing correlation between um, uh, gathering that information and driving approaches which deal with attainment within local authorities. The, there's a deep understanding of what we need to do, and that is in gestation. But... Well, what you also need to recognise, actually, that the issues are slightly different in different contexts across the country. So, actually, deprivation is a pervasive issue. Deprivation exists in my local authority area, Scottish Borders Council, as it does in relation to West Dumbartonshire or Inverclyde or Glasgow, but it's, it's, it's composed differently within the school environment. That suggests that some of the approaches that need to be developed in responding to it are consequently different. And actually, again, these propositions speak to the fact that what you need is an approach which is reflective of national parameters and trying to deliver something for the country as a whole, but reflective of the local dimension as well, so that there is proper and profound understanding of the context in which kids and in individual local authorities operate so that you can build responses which suit their particular needs. And actually, without a proper dialogue on this proposition, we will not get to that point. So we need to return to a proposition where you have an effective compact between central and local government to respond to these issues. I, I, I do appreciate that, but... Sorry, go ahead. Sort of keen to come in here on, yes, on, on that Yes, question. I'm quite happy. And perhaps if they could address the Audit Scotland, uh, no consistency of data from P1 to S3, yeah. that would be helpful. Chair, that's what I wanted to just come in and augment Councillor Cook's evidence here. I mean, uh, we, we've uh, submitted a, a paper to this committee that actually strongly suggests that a national improvement framework should be developed. Um, and uh, within that, um, we, we are supportive of the use of standard, standardised assessments as part of that comprehensive framework, as opposed to the blunt instrument of national testing. Uh, we certainly uh, have got a lot of data. Uh, it's important that we use data uh, positively, uh, but certainly uh, a, a, a national improvement framework which has as its basis curriculum for excellence, which is very clear on levels of numeracy and literacy. And, and incidentally, when we talk about literacy, it's important we talk about digital literacy as part of a, a child's uh, suite of gifts, if you like, uh, in terms of the skills they de develop in, in school. So, yeah, we're, we're very much in, in favour uh, in favour of that. Um, that national improvement framework should be developed uh, between the national agencies in Scotland, the uh, Scottish Government, uh, Education Scotland, uh, the local authorities uh, and our own association. And in our own 2020 vision, uh, we, we said a little bit about that. Ades has said a, a, a bit about that. So, yes, we support a national improvement framework, uh, Mr Scanlon, but we, we, you know, we would like to see that in a, in a comprehensive manner, not just the, the blunt instrument uh, of national testing. Uh, and we would also uh, prefer that there be... Uh, a Scottish, if you like, a Scottish suite uh, of assessments as opposed to the, the 27 authorities who are, are buying those in and I think that's something we can improve on. Right, just my, my final question is, uh, well, partly for ADAS, but you talk about um, suggesting the bill should replace and supersede the national priorities. Uh, you know, does that mean the attainment gap should be the only statutory priority? Perhaps you could uh, say that. But uh, I'm not sure I'm totally understanding your... In your submission, you say national performance improvement framework, uh, and you say that based on what can be used to account for improvement, what actually works in schools, it sounds to me more like an instrument of what is good practice I mean, I thought attainment was about identifying the, the child that needs a bit of additional support at the earliest opportunity, so pre preferably preschool, the earliest stage of primary, and what you're talking about, I'm not totally understanding it. The Audit Scotland report said some East Wren uh, do testing in, prime, I think, four times in primary, 
and again before they come to do national fours and fives. I don't know what you're talking about, this national improvement framework. Is it a document of good practice or does it identify what each <coughs> child needs to have an equal opportunity? If I could take the first point, the 2000 Act, uh, you, you mentioned that. We, we certainly think that the 2000 Act need, needs uh, uh, to be reviewed. Uh, there are aspects of the 2000 Act which directly relate uh, and refer to, uh, to national priorities, and those were the national priorities of the day, and there was a reporting mechanism that's in, uh, included in the 2000 Act that, that we think uh, ne needs some review by this, this body here. Um, as, as far as the National Improvement Framework is concerned, um, it's important that a teacher has access to information about how well her children are progressing uh, at each stage. Um, and I think the National Improvement Framework that we're looking for would certainly have uh, standardised assessments at key stages of a child's development. Right. At key stages of a child's development. There's mixed practice across the country. The 27 authorities that you mentioned, one authority uh, has standardised assessments at the end of each year of a child's progress. Others are, 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 are far less frequent than that. And I think that's where we need to have the discussion. Uh, the system needs to get round the table and agree how, how best to do that. So we need information about each individual learner, but we also need uh, information about the cohort in a school and the cohort nationally. And that will help us. Intelligent use of data will help us to improve Scottish education. Cosler, I agree with that. Yeah. If you could be brief, please. Yeah. Okay. Broadly speaking, we, we do agree that there should be a national framework, but there the clearly needs to be thought in terms of development of that process. Thank you very much. Um, Liam MacArthur, with a quick supplementary, Liam, if you don't mind. Yeah, just um, on the issue of, of attainment, to, to Councillor Cook, um, Paul Cosler, as George Adams suggested, have, have been generally quite um, sceptical of, of this aspect of the, uh, of the bill. Uh, it's nothing to the scepticism of Keir Bloomer, who suggested that the, the uh, have regard to the desirability requirement within the bill could lead to what he said, what we will get is competition among authorities to produce reports that make them look as good as possible. Uh, would you agree? And to add this, could I perhaps ask in terms of the attainment fund, I think Mr Robertson, you, you backed up what was in your written evidence, which uh, said that the strong correlation that currently exists between social deprivation and poverty, uh, on the one hand, and poor educational attainment on the other, such that success too often depends on where a child lives. You'll be aware of the concerns that by focusing on seven local authorities, um, there is a, a risk we ignore the 60 plus percent of those living in poverty out with those seven areas, and therefore how we address the, the need to close the attainment gap there would, would welcome your observations. It wasn't as quick as supplementary as I'd hoped, but um, <laughs> could I, if, if you could be as quick as possible so we can move on. Thank you. I, I, I mean, clearly you're asking a loaded question. Uh, I, I think it suffice to say that there are um, there's some repetition, actually, between the 2000 Act in terms of the reporting duty in relation to attainment and what's proposed now and the utility of some of that reporting proposition, given the fact that we all will already have a responsibility to do that, must be in, in some doubt. Um, can I just very quickly touch on the point that you've raised with ADES as well, which is to make the point, actually, the Attainment Challenge Fund, welcome though that is as a proposition, again reflects, unfortunately, a failure to discuss and consult. So, actually, that was announced as being targeted at seven local authorities without there being any consideration or indeed consultation or discussion in relation to how you address the broad sweep of deprivation across the country. Now, um, I think as, as we've already discussed to some extent, deprivation is a pervasive issue and actually even in apparently comparatively wealthy areas, there are issues of deprivation and we need to understand that and actually through a process of dialogue, one hopes we would get there. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the seven lo local authorities that have been identified in the first tranche for the, for the fund, uh, they are obviously uh, in some detail in terms of formulating their plans. Um, I think it's important we remind ourselves that a child living in poverty is a child living in po poverty no matter where that child is in Scotland, and we, we are acutely aware of that, and we've reflected that to, to, to Scottish Government. Um, I, I was a director in two large rural authorities. I'm very aware of what rural deprivation is, is like as well. And that is why uh, the association is in discussion with, with the local and Scottish Government on a thing that we're calling the universal offer. What is it that every school in Scotland can get? 
from this attainment challenge, from the funds that have been set aside, very helpfully set aside, to actually deal with what I described as the, the biggest single challenge in Scottish education. Um, I think there's a, a lot of learning uh, that we can share across the country. There are resources we can share across the country. And we can also uh, uh, develop through the, our association these inter-authority partnerships where, in fact, what's happening in one good practice in one authority can be shared in another. And I know that was some of the, the discussion at the, the recent causal event as well. So we're, we, are, we are acutely aware uh, of, the, of the seven local authorities that have been selected, but there are, there are challenges elsewhere, and we're working with Government and Education Scotland on this universal offer uh, that we're describing for all children who are living in difficult circumstances. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, I do have to move on. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. I want to move on to the subject of uh, Gaelic medium education. Um, since 2007, there has been a 44% increase in uh, primary one pupils entering Gaelic medium education. There are now 11,500 pupils um, receiving some form of Gaelic medium education across Scotland. So clearly there is a demand from parents um, for their, their children to be educated in Gaelic. So my question is really, will this bill assist that progress resulting in more local authorities providing that Gaelic medium education? The answer to that is probably not. Um, I, I think our reservations with the bill are, are primarily of a, a practical nature, but there's something else I'll move on to. There's no new resources associated with the bill, so, so that is a potential issue. There is also a major supply issue. Um, so there are local authorities in, in the northeast who have been seeking to recruit teachers from Canada. Um, and that is part of the difficulty here, I think, is an expe expectation is being constructed which local authorities are going to be extremely hard-pressed to satisfy. On top of that, of course, the bill has a degree of complexity about it. It's a pretty blunt instrument which sets a series of propositions in terms of how local authorities should take their initial approach and subsequent assessment approaches. Um, one needs to recognise, as I'm sure members here absolutely do, that the Western Isles is not the same as the Scottish Borders. The Scottish Borders has absolutely um, no cultural history of Gaelic whatsoever. And actually, the same approach, so it is proposed, is used at this juncture with, one has to say at the very end of it, potential ministerial intrusion in relation to how they then judge it. If they don't like the conclusions that local authorities have drawn, they can basically subvert that and come to a different position. Um, so I think probably at the back of this, there's a question about resourcing, the practicality of how it will work, and there's an issue about what you might call proportionality. As I say, not all places are the same, but there's a fairly blunt and crude approach which assumes that they are. And I really, I think there should be a much stronger discretionary element in relation to how local authorities respond to this, recognising the differences which exist across the country. But should it not be about responding to parents' demands? Um, I th I, clearly, the, the, the demand is, is an important part of this, but, but one need, needs to recognise also that there's a balance to be struck here in terms of demand and the appropriate direction of resources. So... Um, in the Scottish borders, if you get five requests from, you know, Burnmouth, Copath, Newcastleton, Peebles and Lauder, let's say, you know, that, that's a, a huge geographic area. The, the, the implication of that, perhaps in resourcing implications, is very, very significant. At the same time, you've got to balance that with other priorities, such as attainment, where we've got considerations there, as we've previously discussed in the bill. So there's a balancing judgment to be made there, and parameters should be more flexible, I think, to allow local authorities to do that appropriately, depending on the circumstances which exist. As I say, what you've got is a fairly crude approach, which is not reflective of that. And on top of that, you've got an additional ministerial power, which allows them simply to subvert that um, local discretion. Thank you. I mean, as somebody who's 
uh, had to respond uh, over the years to a uh, request for, for Gaelic medium education. I, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of some of the sentiments that lie behind uh, the, the bill. Um, and I think it's important, Chair, that we remind ourselves that over the last 20 years there's been slow and steady growth to arrive at the statistics that are there. But as Councillor Cook has pointed out, there are significant challenges. The most significant one is actually uh, the supply of qualified Gaelic teachers. Now, what the bill tries to do is uh, ensure that when parents make a request, that they are actually treated uh, in a similar way across the country, no matter which council it is that's actually uh, receiving that, that request. That does seem to, uh, to add as a, a, reasonable, a reasonable request, and we would be very, very happy uh, to, to work with government and local government to, to, to arrive at good practice. And there is some very, very good practice uh, in that uh, across the country. Chair, I do think there's an opportunity through this, uh, th this legislation, uh, and more more likely the statutory guidance that would back it up uh, for perhaps local authorities to work more collaboratively uh, in Gaelic medium education. I'm thinking particularly those who are in cl close proximity, maybe in the, in the periphery of Glasgow and Edinburgh, where you're more likely to get uh, the, the larger numbers uh, of, of requests. And I think uh, looking at this in a collaborative manner uh, and planning it uh, on, on that sort of basis is, 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 is a way for, forward. Um, I think in, in this particular one, the, uh, the, the development of good practice and statutory guidance is something that will be very helpful for local authorities. Now, whilst parents will and should be treated in the same way across the country, it doesn't mean to say that the request will always be successful, because there's a whole variety of, 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 of uh, criteria that you need to apply. And that's why, uh, in the ADES uh, evidence in the bill, we, we, we are actually being quite cautious about having a blunt instrument of, say, five pupils before you actually uh, have, a, have a successful application. What happens in a rural authority compared to an urban authority can be very, very different. You've touched on a, a number of the uh, topics I was going to come on and ask about, but just on that uh, question of consistency, you said in your evidence there requires to be clarity and consistency of expectation of education authorities in relation to Gaelic medium education and Gaelic education generally. And we certainly heard last week in regard to Section 10 that there was too many handicaps that would make it difficult for parents to get the education that they want and which could be used as an excuse by local authorities not to deliver that form of education. So, I mean, how much of a problem do you think that is? I mean, the biggest single problem is the workforce. I mean, and I think that, I mean, this committee has heard evidence to that effect already and the statistics back, back that up. And having said that, the workforce is increasing, uh, but uh, the, the location of the workforce uh, is, 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 a, is a challenge as well. So it's far easier, ironically, to, to uh, recruit a Gaelic medium teacher in Glasgow than it is in some parts of the Highlands. And you may think it would be the other, the other way around. Mrs. Carlin is well aware of that from our, our own constituency. Um, but I think if we had a good practice in terms how, of how uh, these requests are received and assessed, and there is uh, actually some very good practice out there in another piece of legislation that this Parliament has already crafted, uh, and that's the legislation that deals with changes to school provisions, school closures, changes of school boundaries and things like that. Uh, if there's consistency of practice, then I think that's to the strength of local authorities and to the benefit of local authorities. That doesn't mean to say that every request chair that you get for Gaelic medium provision can, can actually be, be positively acknowledged. The, the subject of possibly local authorities sharing resources um, is possibly the use of digital learning a realistic way forward? Uh, yeah, again, we've, we've mentioned that. I've, um, I'm very, very uh, much in favour of uh, the development of, of digital learning, uh, as particularly for secondary education, for Gaelic secondary education, where there's a huge challenge here in terms of what the curriculum uh, is provided through the medium of Gaelic um, and the, the, the development of a, a digital solution to a Gaelic secondary curriculum is long overdue and something that uh, ADES has asked for for a number of, a number of years now. Um, one thing I would point out, um, uh, Mr MacDonald, is that this provision is for Gaelic medium primary education. 
and again in our submission, uh, we have indicated that it is not normally uh, the case that a parent would want to uh, look at just the primary provision for their child. Uh, it's the 3 to 18 provision, if you like, and therein lies the conundrum for, for Garlic because there's such a shortage of teachers who can teach a specialised subject through the medium of Garlic, therefore the digital solution. So just my, my final question is, what is the way forward? Because the evidence we heard last week was that the extension of the Gaelic uh, education provisions of the bill to early years and secondary education is essential to ensure a secure future for the Gaelic language. So if we were going to do some kind of a uh, piecemeal approach to this, wh where should the focus be? Should it be in nursery? Should it be in secondary school provision? Or should it be across the board? Well, I mean, I, I personally think that if we are looking at education in the round, uh, that is a 3 to 18 perspective that we should be taking. Uh, there's some outstanding uh, Gaelic uh, early years provision across the country. It's that actually that's led to the increase in numbers uh, into the primary schools. Uh, so that's, that's to be commended. Um, I would suggest that it's important for local authorities to look at the provision in the round and to plan collaboratively as often as they can. One local authority may not be able to sustain Gaelic medium provision in one, one small part of, of, their, of their area, but actually two or three working together, sharing resources and getting additional resources through the Gaelic specific grant, something we haven't mentioned, and perhaps a review of the specific grant to target that is something that I would advise. Okay, okay. thanks very much. Councillor Cook, do you have any yeah. comment on that last question? Um, yes, I mean, planning collaboratively, it, it, there is desirability in that. Consistency of practice, some consistency of practice, I think we would be sympathetic to that. Um, in terms of thresholds, however, it's worth remind, reminding ourselves that for all of, that we might talk about consistency of practice, actually ministers will have the power to, to ultimately vary thresholds. Now, if that is used in a more positive way which reflects local dimensions, I would perhaps be less anxious about it. But, but I think the local aspect of this, frankly, has been lost. If an area like mine was to take the view that there should not be Gaelic teaching, people would be rightly affronted. Um, you know, we're supportive of, of Gaelic teaching. However, I don't think the, the bill is necessarily reflective of the cultural realities which exist in our area. And I think that needs to be better understood. And I think that local di dimension to decision-making is quite important. But the, the, the rather crude approach to the one-size-fits-all, I think, has rather lost that. Um, in terms of revenue as well, it needs to be appreciated that the revenue stream that you've talked about is currently utilised by local authorities. There is no additional revenue provision here. So, actually, you take it away from the current resource which is provided, that's a diversion of resource, something else needs to be found to make that up. So there is a resource pressure here, and the most fundamental pressure clearly is the supply. Uh, a, a brief supplementary from Ms Scanlon. Brief. Section 13 of the bill, and particularly Councillor Cook, every education authority must promote the potential provision uh, uh, of Gaelic medium education. Um, is, are you content with, uh, with that part of the bill, that you must promote Gaelic medium education and learning? Um, it, well, I think there's a question about what that precisely means. I mean, clearly, as a local authority, I, I'm not here to answer for Scottish Borders Council, it has to be said, um, though I'm aware that they have put in a submission which is reflective of some of the comments I've made. I think there is a kind of cultural sensitivity to some propositions contained within the bill because of our particular heritage. Um, so broadly speaking, we would be supportive of Gaelic education, as is COSLA. Um, I just think, again, had there been a better consideration of some of the propositions as they were developed for the bill, the greater sensitivity and proportionality might have been achieved. And I think those things have been overlooked somewhat. Thank you. Um, Liam MacArthur. Can I move you on to the, the issue of additional support needs? Obviously, the bill looks at um, expanding uh, rights in, in this respect. There has been, however, a, a concern um, raised that 
Um, if I quote Inclusion Scotland, um, it seems illogical that an education authority that is being challenged about additional support needs should have a right to determine whether the person who is making that challenge has a right uh, to make it. That does not seem to be natural uh, justice. I think there the, the concern is that the, the judgment over capacity and best interests is made by the local education authority. Is that, uh, is that a fair um, reflection of a potential conflict? Uh, and if so, how might it be addressed? Um, through the bill, the proposition, as you've laid it out, is, 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 is fair. We, we have not come today, I have to say, with, with particular representations to make on, on this aspect of the bill. Our focus has primarily been in relation to the attainment, Gaelic education, and obviously, Chief Education Officer. In the case of, uh, of this part of the bill, um, I think it's, uh, it is a very difficult situation that, uh, that must be reflected on an individual case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I think Scotland uh, should be very proud of its additional support needs legislation, which has been developed uh, particularly through the, the, this Parliament in 2004 Act, very, very significant. Um, I think the capacity and best interest test is, 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 very, uh, is very important. Uh, there are, unfortunately, uh, some uh, young people who cannot advocate on their, on, on their own behalf. Uh, so that's why uh, um, ADES is, uh, is supportive of this, this element. How can we try and uh, address uh, the issues that, uh, that Inclusion Scotland raised with you uh, last week? Uh, I think it's important that uh, as, the, as the legislation is developed, we have a uh, good working practice guidance and good statutory guidance developed that actually can help uh, local authorities and, and those who uh, look after the interests of individual young people work, work, work through this. Um, some children, unfortunately, just may not have the capacity to self-represent. Uh, and we do not want to get into a situation where, for example, a young person finds himself or herself in conflict with her, his parents or carers because of capacity issues. So it's a very difficult situation. We have checks and balances along, along the way and good advice for those who are involved. I think that's part way to answering your question. The government have, um, I think, been reluctant to try and put a, a, a number or an estimate of, of those who are likely um, to require this sort of support and, and utilise these provisions, and therefore it's not reflected in terms of additional resource within the financial memorandum. Is that is your expectation that the numbers are likely to be very, very limited, um, and therefore the, the resource implications fairly limited as a as a result? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Javon. Thank you, convener. Councillor Cook, I'm, I'm slightly disappointed by your answer to Lee MacArthur's first point, given that the conflict um, will, will have a detrimental effect, as we've heard in evidence, particularly from Inclusion Scotland, and might take us into some um, legal aspects, so the UN rights to the child, that causally don't have a firm view as to what that will mean for children with additional needs, and they're not concerned that actually you can find yourself in a situation where you're determining someone's capacity or not. I, I think it's unfortunate that you've come with views on every other subject but not this one. Can I answer that? Uh, occasionally, Ades uh, represents Coslin. I think on this issue, Ades speaking for Coslin now. Yes, we, we, we occasionally are asked just, to... I, I, just, just for clarity's sake, because obviously you it's represent Addis. It's, 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 a, it's a very technical question. It's yeah. a very technical issue. So uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect elected members to be briefed on the legal technicalities of capacity and best interest. And there is a, a conflict between the issue of capacity and best interest. And the technical issue, I think, is at what stage you decide at capacity and if you've already decided capacity, do you then separately have to determine best interest? And I think the discussion is at what point in the process do you, do you decide and who's best place to do that? It's, it's not the case that authorities would find it unusual in having to balance uh, two competing uh, priorities and two, two competing interests. So in relation to additional support needs, quite often they separate out the, the different perspectives. So they have psychologists, for example, who often do the technical assessment and would make a judgment on issues like uh, capacity or interest. 
but there might be another pressure in terms of the budget. So if you are looking at where to place a child, uh, you look at the very best interests of, of, of the child, but you have to operate within the council parameters and, and there might be a, a budget issue there. So it's quite a technical issue. Uh, I think it, 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 it comes down to the, the procedure behind how, how this is encapsulated. But authorities often are in the situation where they're, they're trying to balance on the one hand, the best interests of the child and other legal requirements and other pressures. Uh, so if you're looking at a school exclusion, if you're looking at placing requests, a whole number of areas where you're dealing with individual cases, individual children, involves that balance. But the, but the, the overriding principle has to be the best interests of the child. So if you're looking at a complaint against a teacher or against a school, you could argue there's, there's a conflict of interest there but it's the duty of local authorities to ensure that they, they meet their obligations towards the staff, but they also put the interests of the child absolutely first. Uh, so it, it's, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be political, I'm just saying it's, it's quite a technical and specialised issue, which probably, which probably justifies our position on the need to have a <laughs> chief education officer. <laughs> right, we'll come to that. That's the I'm not sure Cos will allow you to speak on that particular issue for them. Um, but move, moving, swift, moving swiftly on. <laughs> Be swiftly on. Uh, Chick Brody, please. Yes. The schedule that was introduced by Section 17 of the Act talks about modifying the Educational Act of 2004 with regard to, uh, we've just talked about capacity and the approach to the additional support needs tribunals. In Scotland. Um, in 2012, there was some concern expressed about the relationship between the government and ASTNS in terms of the process. I just wonder if, whether COSLA uh, believes that the bill makes absolutely clear now the respective roles of the Scottish Government and ASTNS in relation to uh, Section 70 complaints. I can try and answer that, and perhaps colleagues in our desk can, can pick up on any gaps I've left off. Good morning. Um, I mean, our understanding of Section 70 from, um, from Scottish uh, the reforms that have been proposed is effectively to, tight, to tidy up some um, anomalies that, that may exist, um, whereby they would effectively be able to um, some decisions that would normally go to the Additional Support for Needs Tribunal could additionally be. be taken through a Section 70, um, 70 procedure. So it, our understanding is that effectively this is a tidying up um, to, to say, well, if something should appropriately go to the SN tribunal, then that should be the, the, um, should be the, appropriate, the appropriate route, and it should be handled in the, the best possible way to, to, resolve, to resolve the issue. Are these circumstances, in view, your view, quite clearly defined in terms of, of, of a, a, the role that ASA did? You know, Yep. The From our point of view, we would consider it's defined enough that if it if it should go to the ASN tribunal, then that it should go to the ASN tribunal. That's the best way for handling additional support needs um, uh, requests. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, you okay with that? Okay. Thank you. Is there anything more that local authorities uh, could do to ensure that people are more aware, better aware of their rights to complain under Section 70? Think we'd argue that there's, there's ever we've ever reached a point where you, you can do no more. Um, I think um, that uh, Section 70, by and I, I don't have the numbers. The numbers are relatively small. Um, I think uh, there are ways in which that it can be, can be promoted, but I suppose, but it should be seen as a last resort as well. Other compa complaints handling um, processes within the authority really should be used as a as a as a first um, a first way of dealing with any with any form of um, um, of issue before it really gets to the issue of of requiring a section seventy. Okay, I wonder. I may just one last one to ask uh, Mr. Robson and Mr. Stotter. It, clearly, we've had a discussion around the capacity and interests of children and uh, how their capacity is, is secured or determined. Who determines the parent's capacity in an area, issue of conflict? The, the parent, presumably, they are, they are the legal... Oh, but, 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 but that assumes that all parents have that capacity. So who, who secures the interests of the child, for example, who may have the ability to determine 
uh, their needs uh, better than the parents. So who determines the parents' capacity? If there was any doubt about the parents' capacity, then presumably social work colleagues would have a view on that. Uh, I think the reason for giving rights to children is that they can represent themselves. Uh, it does raise the interesting possibility that uh, a child could decide uh, to represent themselves and advocate for an issue that was not in their best interests. Uh, and that's why all of the parties need an avenue, whether it's the individual child, whether it's the parent of that child, whether it's the authority that, may, that will have a, a legal obligation. Any assessment of a parent's capacity? It doesn't go on just now, does it? it it might do in terms of social, social work involvement. Yes, it, it might well do. And okay. the children's hearing system uh, can kick in there as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, moving on to the subject that was just uh, mentioned a few moments ago, uh, Colin. Thank you, Vera. Uh, I'd like to explore a little bit about the role of the Chief Education Officer. Um, the Bill obviously requires education authorities to appoint a Chief Education Officer. It doesn't give the CEO any particular function but the role is obviously to advise the authority on carrying out its functions under relevant legislation. Qualifications are to be set by the Scottish Ministers, but the experience to be determined by the local authority. Do we need a Chief Education Officer? Me first, is it? Um, I, the view of COSLA is, is that we don't. Uh, I think we have two uh, specific difficulties with the proposition as it currently stands. One is the purpose of, of this proposition. Um, I highlighted to you earlier the, the passage of consultation which took place in relation to the various different elements which construct this bill. Um, this was one of the propositions which was a late entry, as it were. This, this was something that was first broached with us on the 13th of January this year. Um, and it is still not clear, I think, what the utility of the proposition is. Um, comparisons have been made with chief social work officers and chief education officers, if you like. Our understanding of the role, as it's currently posited for chief education officer, is that it's primar primarily an advice role. Uh, clearly, that's, that's very different, actually, from what you're talking about in relation to a, a chief social worker role. Um, they have very, very specific statutory responsibilities, so in relation to adoption, secure care, things of that nature. Very, very specific role. This is a much more generalist proposition. Um, where it actually sits and its utility, as I say, is open to question. I think also there's a further problem with it from our perspective is it's something which has been thought up, which is now being consulted on in relation to its inclusion in the bill. And actually what it does is it actually usurps local discretion in relation to the construction of management structures that local authorities consider appropriate to the management of their responsibilities and in so doing it usurps local democratic accountability. I, I appreciate the members sitting around this table are democratically elected, um, so too am I and actually so is every other member of my local authority. We have an absolute responsibility to look at the affairs of the local authority, make judgments about that, and we have to agree the governance model that we deploy to achieve that. This basically usurps this without evident purpose. Chris? Yeah, I'm going to disagree with that, with uh, Coslaw on this occasion. But it's uh, the fact that there isn't a requirement to have such a post is an anomaly, and it was created by Michael Forsyth in the run-up to local government reorganisation. So the 1980 Ed Education Act required authorities to have such a post, and in fact, the whole of the 88 Act is kind of predicated on the fact that you've got somebody experienced and qualified who can, who can advise the education authority. And I think that's the important point, that councils act as education authorities the fact that they don't have a, a, a person who is appropriately qualified and experienced to advise them in that capacity seems to us to be uh, strange. At that time, there was a different political context, obviously. Uh, schools were being encouraged to uh, opt out of local authority and, and control and to self-govern. Uh, and, and as I say, Cosler were strongly opposed to that, and they used the same argument at that stage. It was, it was a political interference. Uh, uh, I, I, the only thing that's changed since then has actually been the political context. 
So in 1996, new councils were set out. They continued as if there were a requirement to have the post. They ignored the fact that there wasn't a requirement. And for 10 years, that held uh, unilaterally across Scotland in 32 authorities. One council in 2006 tried to operate without one, but it was a disastrous failure and it involved external intervention from uh, HMIE and from Audit Commission and a, a task force with COSLA and government. Uh, and two years later reverted to having the post. What's worrying for us is in the past two, well, the past three years really, we've seen four councils beginning to, to move away from that post and not to have that post. Two of those councils have actually submitted evidence to you, coincidentally, and, and two of them are actually in favour of having the post. Although, strangely, one of them thinks the post shouldn't have any qualifications or uh, experience attached to it. The, the, a couple are equivalent, and the others uh, who are negative about it say they already do it anyway. Uh, the work of this committee over the years has covered a huge range of very significant issues for Scotland, very complex issues, and issues in which you have asked for uh, advice. And ADES often provides that advice and guidance, and we always provide somebody who is appropriately qualified and experienced. So you, there's a whole range of issues, and I could spend all morning uh, reading them. But you, you've got eight big issues, teacher workforce, curriculum for excellence, qualifications, uh, education finance, rural schools. These are ones that I just remember uh, being here with colleagues to, to give evidence. Additional support needs. Uh, and as I say, it, it, you can't imagine a parliament or a, an education authority operating without that uh, advice from a qualified and experienced person. The parallels with the Chief uh, Social Work Officer are, I think, relevant and germane. I've got the specifications for the Chief uh, Social Work Officer, and every single one of them, apart from one, would relate to this kind of post. So you're talking about establishing standards and values, making sure that staff meet standards uh, of the regulatory bodies, to support and advise managers, to use registered workers, and obviously we have teachers and, and other staff who have various requirements. The governance arrangements, the balance of risks, uh, workforce planning, professional development and leadership for the managers in the organisation, these all apply uh, equally uh, to, the, to the post of chief education officer. The, the one that doesn't apply is a specific piece of legislation on adoption and guardianship. But as I've already indicated, there's a whole plethora of legal requirements within an education authority that would certainly be equivalent and, and in fact, greater than, than that legal responsibility, attendance, exclusion, zoning issues, education at home, additional support needs, placing requests, school closures, and so on. The list, the list is a long one. So one of the issues that COSL has raised is the issue that this is a, an interference with uh, structures. Uh, we don't think it is uh, telling councils what structures they have to have. It's simply a requirement that a specific level of post is incorporated within that structure. You can think of the example of children's services. In some cases, a social work director runs the children's services. They don't have access to a single person who is the education officer uh, who, who would advise them. On the other hand, there are some councils where an education person uh, runs the the children's services, they do have access to a chief social work officer to ensure that anything they do uh, complies with relevant legislation. We think there are significant benefits to councils and to the Scottish Government in having appropriately qualified and experienced people uh, at that post in terms of ensuring that uh, political decisions, policy decisions, strategy decisions are fit for purpose. And even in the evidence you've heard on this bill, I'm sure you'll have recognised the the need for a qualified, experienced advice. Okay, thank you very much. Colin? Would the panel agree that in a, in a normally uh, efficient council that all the expertise that we're talking about here would exist already and that it would actually make sense in some ways for there to be one point of contact in order to be able to tap into that expertise rather than having a number of different areas to go to? Doesn't that make sense? 
Absolutely, that makes sense. Um, you're making the point very well, in fact, that um, as, as far as we're concerned, that raises a question about the utility of the proposition, because it, it's not, as, as seemed to be intimated, as though that kind of professional advice doesn't exist within local authorities. Plainly, it does exist within local authorities. And the fact is, if, if this proposition... Um, even though it's not properly fleshed out at this juncture, does come to pass, is the reality is that someone exists in practically every local authority in the land. I think there's perhaps one local authority would need to, to deal with its approach differently and look to appoint someone who could carry out this role. I suspect that for mo most local authorities, there would be someone who would be slotted into that role directly. In which case, of course, you might reasonably say to me, why then is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because actually getting that advice, determining who gives that advice, really is a matter of my discretion and my local authority and the other 33 members who inhabit that local authority. And we judge that we can make that kind of determination that it's not appropriate, actually, for Scottish Government to overreach that and make a judgment about what the structure or the relationship should be in our individual local authority. So that really is, I think, largely where the issue is. I'm grateful to John that he acknowledged our position on this has been consistent throughout, even from some years ago, and indeed it has. Um, but what I think is different from our perspective, perhaps, is the local authority has a much stronger view of its own responsibility and accountability in relation to these issues. It's being do, doing work on this. And, you know, it may be seen that we're being slightly precious about it, but actually this isn't, I don't think, just a view of elected members and local authorities. Chief executives, I, I think clearly, certainly in terms of my dialogue with them, um, are somewhat unhappy with, with what they see as an interference here. They would certainly see the structure of their management teams as being a matter that they are ultimately responsible for. And this is some subversion of that. As for the advice, that clearly exists already. In yeah. fact, uh, there, are, there clearly are some councils that are inconsistent in their approach in this, perhaps resulting in this uh, proposition. Where's the evidence for that? There was evidence given earlier in well, the... Can, can I ask if we only had one? Yeah. I one, mean, one authority. I, I, I think it's important to recognise that that's merely a matter of evidence. The evidence that I'm giving you is quite clear. Actually, professional advice... Of, of the kind provided by these guys is available in every local authority. There's one local authority that we'd need to make an appointment to respond to the proposition within the bill on chief education officer. Mm. Uh, uh, Robert. Uh, uh, just, just to add to that point, the authority who currently wouldn't have somebody with the requisite qualifications, what they have said is they do have systems in place that allows their managers to work collegiately with all the head teachers so that they can actually determine educational advice for the, for the authority. So there is a system in place, even though the manager in charge doesn't have an education qualification. Thank you for that. John? Because yeah, they have been consistent, I was arguing they have been inconsistent. They strongly opposed the removal of the post in 1994 Local Government Act uh, and, and now they're using the same arguments to, to say the post should be should remain removed. Uh, local councils have a number of statutory posts. We're surely not arguing that it's important that they have somebody responsible for the, for the finances, a finance officer, uh, and that could be in a very small council with a very small total budget which could be less than the whole of the education budget. And yet we shouldn't have a, a statutory officer for education. It is, there is a symbolic value in having a, a person who is appropriately uh, qualified at the, at the right level to advise the education authority. And we believe there are now, and th these, these are recent, very recent developments, there are now four authorities that potentially uh, don't have the appropriate uh, post within the structure. And that's not to say where in the structure, it's just that they should have somebody that they can rely on that is, that is the port for that statutory legal advice. And the issue quite often is that you can get anybody to give advice, you can get anybody to understand the law, uh, you can get anybody to know the business, but there is professional judgment often involved in some of the tricky issues that, that we talked about earlier in terms of capacity, the interest of the child and so on. There are, there are professional judgment issues uh, and it's best if that comes from somebody suitably qualified and experienced and it comes from a single port because no doubt there will be a range of views within different post holders within a council.
I'm going to, I know I said right at the beginning not two answers from the same organisation, but I did allow you two answers from, from COSLA, so I'll do the same, Bruce. Very brief. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's important we remind ourselves that this is a £4 billion operation we're talking about across the country. That's, that's what state education uh, re relates to uh, across the 32 local authorities. Um, we, we come here today having thought this through very, very carefully, understanding what's happening out, out there, and we genuinely think that this post will add value to the work of Parliament. You require, through statute, for example, to have reports from, from education authorities. It will add value to the work of Parliament, to Scottish Government, and actually it will add value to the work of local councils because you've seen the list of, of the duties and the rules that we, we've submitted in evidence. It's to their advantage to have people in positions to discharge those. Liam, has the question, your question been answered? Could you be very, very brief and I can have brief answers yeah. as well? Thank you. I, I'm, I'm listening to, to what's been said on this issue and I think since we had the evidence from the build team and throughout the other witnesses we've heard, whether they support it or not, I haven't heard anybody identify a problem we're being asked to address through this bill. And it just looks to me that we've got a solution here that's in desperate search of a problem. And we only legislate when we absolutely need to. And despite the, the use of Michael Forsyth's name, which I recognise as political catnip for, for, for colleagues, I don't identify a problem here that we're being asked to, to resolve. You surely don't want to legislate uh, at the point when you have a problem? No, but I won't, I won't le reach for the legislative lever until it's been demonstrated to me there's a problem that needs to be addressed and a risk that, is, that, that, is, that, that something is about to go uh, astray that we, need to, that we need to rectify proactively. And, and in neither sense have I heard evidence of, of that. I agree with that. Oh, yes. Right, right. So can I just have a, a quick answer from Ades then on it? I believe there is a risk in not having such a person advising local authorities. We probably could bring forward evidence, but it would be inappropriate to do so at this point. Uh, it's a recent phenomenon that some authorities don't have such a post. We anticipate and advise that there, there, there could be difficulties in that respect in some of the decisions that authorities uh, have to make. OK, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to leave it there uh, because we are very pushed for time. We're already running late this morning. Um, can I thank you all very much for coming along this morning? Thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to suspend briefly um, while we change witness panels.
Can I welcome uh, this morning to committee Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, and to our accompanying officials. Good morning to all of you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will answer questions about all parts of the Bill except provisions on Gaelic and additional support needs. Uh, these will be addressed by the Minister, Alistair Allen, uh, in the next panel. Um, however, I believe the Cabinet Secretary will make some opening remarks on the Bill as a whole. If that's correct, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, it is, Convener, and uh, thank you very much, and uh, good morning uh, to Committee. Uh, convener, there is much to be proud of in Scottish education, particularly the achievements of our children and our young people. Uh, we have record exam passes, uh, a record proportion of young people going into positive destinations after leaving school, and youth unemployment is the lowest it's been in several years. Uh, but, of course, there is always much more to do, uh, much more to do in terms of making improvements. And we must do more to raise the platform for all children and do more to raise the attainment um, of those children and young people who are doing less well in school. And we know that there is an attainment gap in Scotland between the children from the least and most disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's what I and this government is absolutely determined to tackle. The bill was already in development when I became the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. Uh, it contains a, a wide and diverse range of important measures as part of uh, an overall improvement agenda. But for me, the, the big admission, the big gap, was that the bill uh, contained nothing on narrowing the attainment gap and nothing on reducing uh, the inequalities of educational outcomes uh, that we know exist. So, therefore, I introduced to the Bill uh, duties on councils and on ministers to reduce the inequalities of outcome we see as a result of socio-economic disadvantage uh, and for councils and ministers to report on progress made. I believe, convener, that the Bill uh, will have a positive impact and that it will make a difference. It makes a clear and emphatic statement uh, that Scotland will no longer accept uh, that a child's background or circumstances matter more uh, than their talent or their efforts. But the bill, as we know, is not in itself, uh, it won't in isolation deliver the improvements that we all want to see. Uh, and that's why the provisions in the bill are just one element of a package of measures uh, in place to narrow the attainment gap uh, for example, we've got the Attainment Challenge and Reason Attainment for All programme. The Bill also addresses a number of areas that the Government wants to see improvements in. Uh, specifically, firstly, uh, supporting and promoting Gaelic education. Uh, the Gaelic language is a key part of both our heritage and cultural life, uh, and it's right that we do more to secure uh, a future for Gaelic, and Dr Allen will speak more about that later. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to ensure that children have a, a stronger voice in their learning, um, especially those children with additional support needs. And again, Dr Allen uh, will address that in his evidence this morning. Thirdly, we want to ensure that we provide a measure of consistency in terms of standards and quality of teaching staff, uh, regardless of where they teach. And fourthly, the appointment uh, of appropriately qualified uh, chief education officers across Scotland is something that the Bill will introduce. And uh, finally, we want to see a more uh, robust process for complaints, uh, for when complaints are made to ministers, because we want to ensure that an appropriate process exists, uh, which will allow disagreements about a child's education uh, to be resolved in a timely manner. So, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, convener. I welcome the opportunity that I now have with committee uh, and with Parliament to uh, scrutinise this wide-ranging bill uh, further, and I'm sure we can all have an um, open and honest debate about how the bill uh, can help us to uh, continue to improve education in Scotland. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for your statement. I'm just going to move to uh, questions now and begin with George Adam. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. You will be aware of the, some of the submissions we have already received with regards to uh, from COSLA and ADES in particular. Uh, COSLA, uh, just before you came here, I, I regarded uh, some of the submissions quite negative. In fact, I could have probably cut and pasted it from previous uh, submissions I have made in other issues. 
But on the whole, we need to address, as you've already mentioned, the, the attainment issue. Now, ADES and their written submission have said clearly the legislation of itself will not ensure improvement, but will provide a clear strategic focus. Now, you said something very similar yourself in your opening remarks. So can I just ask, Cabinet Secretary, to what extent can legislation uh, reduce the attainment gap? Well, I, mean, I think legislation is very important. Um, as uh, I did say, Mr Adam, in my opening statement, um, you can't view legislation in isolation. Um, and legislation has to be um, part of the overall uh, jigsaw. And I alluded to uh, the other aspects uh, of action that has to be taken, you know, namely around the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge, uh, the Attainment Scotland Fund. Uh, you know, but there are things like the Early Years Collaborative, the Reason Attainment for All uh, programme as, as, as well. Um, where legislation is uh, important, I think it does provide a, a strong signal uh, that locally and nationally we are committed to uh, improvement, uh, that locally and nationally we uh, recognise the importance of all our children uh, reaching their full potential, and that we are not um, accepting uh, that a children's background or circumstances is more important uh, than their talents or, or, or efforts. So it's a strong signal about the Scotland uh, that we seek. Uh, I think our proposals are also about strengthening um, accountability uh, of both Scottish ministers uh, and our partners uh, in, in local government. Uh, I think it is only fair and reasonable uh, that we account for the actions that we have taken uh, to address the attainment gap, but also to map out the actions that we will take uh, to map out the, the attainment gap. And it's also about having uh, visibility uh, of what action is being taken uh, and to continue that to be based on what works and what is effective. So I think it's very important uh, that we strengthen um, accountability of both ministers and uh, local um, authority. And as I said, we know that uh, legislation um, in itself you know, won't work in isolation and it is important that it is seen in the context of that uh, wider package uh, of improvement that we're undertaking. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, uh, the nuts and bolts of it are what kind of resource and actions will be needed to actually weaken the link between disadvantage and educational attainment? You know, uh, we've already discussed that this is a deep-seated and generations, if not decades, uh, long problem. So what level of resource would this require? I think in terms of the um, quite discreet provisions that have been placed uh, in the bill uh, in terms of placing a very clear uh, duty on Scottish ministers and local government and also the, the, the duties to uh, report uh, on progress. Um, there is obviously a cost in terms of uh, the guidance to be produced that underpins those duties so that the costs associated with the bill um, are, are quite discreet and I think the financial memorandum from memory talks uh, in the region of, of £50,000. I think where there is a broader debate and discussion uh, about how we use our resources to uh, close uh, the, the attainment gap. Um, so, you know, the, the overall level of resources is of course important, but as we've seen from the work from um, Audit Scotland in their report, uh, last year that it's also about how resources are deployed uh, and how resources are used. Um, some of our resources do indeed need to be applied um, at a universal level, um, but I certainly uh, see that in some of the evidence and commentary around the bill and some of the evidence that the committee has had, uh, that there is a need to target more effectively. Um, and you can see how that has informed the government's thinking uh, in and around the, the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge. And then, you know, there is the uh, debate and the decisions that we make in terms of resources that are applied to be used within the classroom. And then it's how you use resources to tackle some of the broader issues uh, that are very real outside uh, of a classroom in terms of, you know, addressing poverty uh, and supporting parents. Thank you. Mary Scanlon. Thank you very much. Um, can I, I 
listen carefully to the opening statements, but there were some serious issues which I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would, uh, would identify that were raised in the Audit Scotland report last year, and uh, I, I won't repeat them in over time for time. But could I just, given that there are uh, four sections in the Bill, the first four sections uh, on attainment, and the first sentence is the Bill, of the bill impose duties in relation to reducing pupils' inequality of outcome. Can the Cabinet Secretary point to which part of the first four sections in the bill will actually achieve that reduction in the inequalities of outcome? Well, I think it's very important um, the work that Mrs Scanlon often refers to in terms of Audit Scotland, in terms of that debate about how we apply um, our resources. But in terms of the actual bill, um, I think it is important that we place uh, a very clear uh, legislative responsibility on ourselves uh, as well as our partners in local government, because that's about clarity uh, of purpose. Um, and it is one of the things that we have learned from um, educational systems you know, across the world is that clarity of purpose is very uh, important and that it's actually central. Uh, and I know that some of your evidence from ADES spoke about having that strategic overview and having very uh, clear uh, strategic objectives. And I think tackling inequality uh, should be uh, our number one uh, objective uh, and that we do need to be increasingly focused uh, in our attentions to uh, close uh, the attainment gap that arises as a, as a result of uh, socio-economic uh, advantage. And I think reporting, uh, making very visible and accounting for what we do and why we do it and what we plan to do in the future, I think is very pragmatic. Um, I, and, you know, it's, as I say, the legislation isn't in itself, um, you know, going to uh, resolve the, the attainment gap, but it is a very important uh, foundation, particularly in given that clarity of purpose. I mean, if you know perfectly well you have my party's support in anything to address inequalities and to address attainment. Uh, I'm just, uh, if we can just move on perhaps to implementation, obviously it can only be implemented successfully and it can only achieve what we, we all want it to achieve uh, with uh, goodwill, partnership and uh, respectful working with local government. Um, so can you tell me why was there no consultation on uh, the attainment prior to the bill coming forward. We heard that it was just added in uh, January. And if I can move on to actual implementation, um, ADES and COSLA uh, both spoke, and also Sue Ellis in this committee, we need a national bank of tests and surveys schools can call on, and Lindsay Patterson uh, testing is not alien to the culture of Scottish teaching or Scottish teacher professionalism. So in order to implement this successfully to achieve the outcomes we all want and give every child in Scotland that equal opportunity, are we looking at a form of national assessment along the lines that East Renfrew does um, at different stages of uh, primary, if I can focus on primary education, because the First Minister and Deputy First Minister both said that's where the absence of data is. So do we need a form of uh, assessments or tests or something that we can implement this successfully to achieve what we all want to achieve? Okay. Let me deal with the issue that Mrs Scanlon raises about con consultation uh, first and foremost. Uh, and yes, uh, there has been no uh, formal consultation on this part of the bill. Um, as I hope that I explained in my uh, opening remarks, um, when I took up uh, this position as Cabinet Secretary for Education uh, at the end of November, in, in December, um, this wide-ranging and quite you know, eclectic uh, bill was already uh, in, in, in progress. Uh, but I do make uh, no apologies uh, for inserting what I believe to be uh, some important provisions in and around um, attainment, given uh, the focus that attainment and tackling inequality it has uh, within the, the, the programme for government. I am conscious of the fact that there was no uh, formal consultation and therefore uh, it is important uh, that from you know, the introduction of the bill um, to stage two, that, you know, as a government that we continue to liaise uh, 
um, you know, with, with, with stakeholders. Uh, but I do think, uh, in contrast, I would not have been happy coming to this committee uh, with a bill without uh, specific um, powers in relation to attainment, because I think committee uh, would have rightly asked, given the, the priority that is shared across Parliament and across the political parties, and given the priority within the programme for government uh, to raise attainment, and to tackle inequality within our education system, I think committee uh, would have uh, been rightly critical uh, and, and demanding of the government if you know, I had come to committee with an education bill that is wide-ranging, if there was no particular uh, sections in relation uh, to tackling inequality in, in, in education. But as I said, convener, conscious that you know, we'll have to work hard to continue the dialogue uh, with stakeholders. And we have had um, you know, various uh, discussions and dialogue, you know, whether it's with uh, COSLA, you know, ADES, National Parent Forum for Scotland, uh, and we'll continue uh, to have those discussions to ensure that we get the best uh, bill possible. Oh, sorry. And in terms of your, your other uh, very uh, important uh, issues, um, what I think Mary Scanlon is, is touching on, um, in essence, is the work uh, that we are doing around the National Improvement Framework. Now, the National Improvement Framework shouldn't be per confused with the National Performance Framework, which we already have uh, as a government, and that's about the overall uh, performance uh, of the government and, and the country. So uh, we're talking about a National Improvement Framework uh, in relation to um, education. We know that most local authorities do some sort of standardised uh, assessment, but what we really need that line of sight on is uh, in terms of what's happening in a classroom, to what's happening in a school, to what's happening in a local authority, to what's happening happening at a, at a national level. So we know that you know, various local authorities um, you know, have different forms of uh, standardised uh, assessment. And what we uh, really need now to do is to have you know, a, a, an agreement uh, on standardised assessment um, so that we can get that line of sight about what's happening um, at a very local level uh, to what's happening at, at a national level. And the work that the government is pursuing in and around the National Improvement Framework um, is progressing um, at a pace. And, of course, we look forward to coming back to committee uh, to appraise you of, of the detail of that work in due course. Convener, I think uh, ADES talk about national performance improvement framework and the uh, Cabinet Secretary talks about national improvement framework. So I think uh, it could be forgiven for uh, dropping the word performance uh, uh, and how, how relevant that is. Um, but can I, just my final question, um, 27 out of 32 local authorities buy in private sector tests from England. They can't even compare one local authority to another. This was raised by the Auditor General in her report. Now, uh, Keir Bloomer did uh, say to us that this was pious thinking masquerading as legislation. I would like to think that he was wrong, and I'm looking for that nub that's in here that is going to make a difference. So my final question, convener, if I can just, uh, uh, Keir Bloomer's point, pious thinking masquerading as legislation, uh, section one, paragraph two, uh, pupils experiencing inequalities of income, it says that... Uh, has to have due regard to the desirability of exercising the powers uh, in a way mentioned in subsection, etc., etc. Due regard to a desirability. I mean, I wonder if I can ask respectfully, Cabinet Secretary, do you understand why I'm struggling to find where is this little golden bullet that's going to make a difference here, having due regard to a desirability? Okay. This is addressing inequalities of income. Yeah, I mean, there's a num number of important issues, convener, that, that Mrs. Scanlon raises, and I'll uh, try to go through them as, as, as timidly as possible. Um, comparisons uh, between local authorities uh, are indeed difficult because d uh, different local authorities are using uh, different uh, forms of, of standardised uh, assessments. Um, and I therefore don't consider it pious uh, for the government to be working uh, towards a national improvement uh, framework so that we get that uh, clear uh, line of sight uh, that tells us how well we're doing in terms of tracking and monitoring the progress of individual children about what's happening within a classroom, a school, local 
local authority and to be able to have that real good, clear uh, national uh, picture, I just you know, would consider that purposeful uh, and uh, pra pragmatic. In terms of um, the wording um, of the bill, in terms of having uh, due, due regard, um, I suppose the, the way in which the bill uh, has been drafted uh, reflects the policy uh, intention that we are in the business of raising attainment for all children. We want to raise the platform for all children. Um, but we need to be increasingly focused on the children that are doing less well, the children who have been held back as a result of socio-economic uh, disadvantage, and how we can um, you know, target our efforts and our resources to ensure that those children um, um, get the best possible start to life and that performance increases at a faster rate than the overall uh, improvement. So, you know, we're, we're not trying to do just one thing um, in, in isolation. That said, convener, if there are ways in which we can strengthen the wording of the legislation without having any uh, unintended uh, consequences, uh, we are, of course, open to the, the evidence and advice uh, from, from committee, uh, and we'll certainly take that back to, to the legal uh, drafts, men and women. Yes, um, I've got two quick supplementaries, uh, first from Mark Griffin and second from Liam MacArthur. Thanks, convener. In um, section one of the bill, um, paragraph 3 um, asks local authorities to reduce inequalities of outcome experienced by pupils which result from socio-economic disadvantage and part B gives ministers um, regulating powers to set out um, other circumstances can I ask specifically in those regulations will there be reference made to um, inequalities of educational outcome experienced by pupils who have a sensory impairment I think there are a, a full range of issues uh, that contribute to educational uh, inequalities uh, and of course there will be a full consultation uh, on the regulations that, that come forth um, in, in due course. Um, the reason that we have started with socio-economic uh, uh, disadvantage is that it makes sense to do there. Um, and if you're tackling uh, socio-economic disadvantage, uh, you will also therefore tackle other forms uh, of disadvantage. But that does not mean to say that in, in the fullness of time that we won't need to consider uh, putting in regulation other forms um, of uh, educational inequality and, 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 and disadvantage. So in terms of a very clear starting point, the biggest issue is socio-economic advantage. If we can tackle that, that will help us uh, deal with other types of uh, educational disadvantage. Um, but it may be as we come forward with the regulation that, that there needs to be some finesse on that. Um, so I don't want to be ruling anything in or out at this precise moment. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Due warning, it won't be entirely brief after, after the last session. Um, first of all, you talk, um, Cabinet Secretary, about an eclectic and wide-ranging bill, which I think all of us would accept, and as we get to the end of a parliament, that's possibly uh, inevitable, and you make no apology for inserting the provisions in terms of attainment rather late in the day. But the problem I think I have is that um, there are a number of elements of this that appear to have arrived fairly late in the day. We've had the concerns from COSA about attainment. We had concerns last week from Inclusion Scotland about some of the provisions in terms of additional support needs. We had concerns about the late addition uh, of the Chief Education Officer appointment. Uh, we've had concerns from SCIS in relation to the GTCS uh, requirements for independent schools inserted without uh, much consultation. We've now got a letter that we'll be dealing with later about the insertion of the standard for headship provision in the bill. Now, some of these things command a degree of support. Some of them were problematic, but there appears to be a, a route through in terms of finding a, a workable solution. But all of this creates the impression that this is a bill that's been kind of cobbled together um, as we went along. And as a parliament that's prided itself on pre-legislative scrutiny and consultation in the absence of a, a, a revising chamber, there's an uncomfortable position in which I think this committee has been put because it's dealing with, um, uh, with a piece of legislation um, that hasn't been properly consulted upon. And we're doing some of the work now through our stage one consideration that really should have been done by the government prior to the bill being introduced. Is that, would that be fair? No, not, not entirely. I mean, I you know, would, would accept that there are aspects of the bill that 
where there has been no um, formal uh, consultation, but in terms of um, you know the uh, issues around the, the chief education officer, uh, GTCS uh, registration, uh, the implementation um, of the, the standard uh, for, for, for headship. I mean, there's a process in terms of regulation where there'll be full consultation um, and um, d d d debate. Um, some of what we're, we're dealing with is a consequence of quite a wide-ranging uh, bill. You know, we've got um, you know provisions in re relation to Gaelic um, education, additional support needs. You know, Section 70 complaints. Um, so, you know, some of this I feel is is inevitable. Um, but in terms of you know uh, proper uh, scrutiny, um, in terms of you know consultation over uh, subsequent. Uh, regulations. I mean, there will be, you know, an ample op opportunity. I think we may, may need to disagree on the basis that if things are left solely to secondary legislation and consultation thereafter, I, I think um, it, it does rather bypass the processes this Parliament has in place to, to, to kick the tyres before things are spat out at the other end. In, in relation to attainment, you talked, I jotted it down, clarity of purpose, uh, a, a clear duty on local government, a clear legislative responsibility for partners in, in local government. I think the concern is that the way that the duties um, framed with regard to the desirability, I uh, think Keir Bloomer put it rather well, that what we will get is competition among authorities to produce reports that make them look as good as possible, rather than necessarily any change in practice or, or procedure on the ground. Would you accept that as a, a, as a potential risk? I mean, I think we have to ensure that everything we do in and around reporting that it is purposeful and we always need to, to recognise it's what people do in response uh, to the reports uh, and uh, the, the, the evidence. But I think it is uh, pragmatic and I think it is reasonable uh, to expect the Scottish Government and local authorities, and I'm not asking local authorities to do anything that I don't think Scottish ministers uh, should be doing, to be visible and to be accountable uh, for what they are doing and the evaluation process in terms of what works, what doesn't work and what are the remaining uh, challenges. And I don't think any of that is bureaucratic. I don't think any of that um, is unreasonable. Um, and in terms of uh, you know, the parts of the bill uh, that, uh, yes, indeed, I've asked to be inserted since I became Cabinet Secretary for Education, I mean, they are quite purposeful and quite discreet in terms of placing a duty on both ourselves and our partners in local government uh, and in terms of regular uh, reporting, because we need that visibility and we need that accountability and we need that leadership uh, in terms of being prepared to account um, for what we're doing, what we will do and that debate that is based on evidence and, and, and what works. And I don't see anything un unreasonable or widely well, you know, bureaucratic about with that. With respect, though, Cameron Secretary, you've talked about with regard to the desirability. It almost sounds like that's what you want to do, uh, but you've kind of held back from actually putting in a firmer duty for perhaps very laudable reasons. But actually, we're now um, betwixt and between. There's, it's not going to require of, of, of local government or indeed um, central government uh, anything other than, than a reporting mechanism on the desirability rather than something that is likely uh, to, to, to change uh, purpose and action uh, on the ground. Is that, uh, that would seem to be, um, I think, a very reasonable um, uh, point to be made by Keir Bloomer and indeed others. But if, if you're reporting on the progress you've made or the progress you've not made, there is then democratic scrutiny and expectation and an increased onus eh, on whether it's Scottish ministers, eh, parliamentarians or local authority to act on that information. And I accept that legislation... And isolation isn't the be-all and the end-all. It's what we do in response uh, to our duties and, you know, our, our, our findings. Um, and as I've, you know, already said, um, you know, earlier, um, if if there is a better form of wording, that we will certainly look at that because what we've been clear about um, as a government is that we don't want to uh, hold the highest-performing children back 
until other children catch up. That, you know, as a government, uh, as an education secretary, this has to be about continuous improvement and ensuring that those children and young people that are doing less well, that they are enabled to improve their performance at a quicker rate. That's what we mean by closing the gap. We're not holding people back until others catch up. We want to be continuously improving the platform uh, and closing the gap uh, by ensuring that those um, you know, children from the more disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, that they are improving at a faster rate. Now, that means that you know, we have um, you know, many uh, obligations, statutory obligations, uh, as well as you know, closing the gap. But if there is a way to uh, strengthen the, the wording and to always get that increased uh, clarity of purpose, you know, we um, are open to that because there is no monopoly in wisdom. And you know, I think even the government would concede that. We have known about this problem for, yeah. for, for decades. Um, we have a, a fair amount of data on, on how it manifests itself. And what I think I'm struggling to understand is what this bill does in terms of moving us forward um, without either additional resources to, 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 to back that up or going some way further than it appears to want to go at the moment uh, in terms of the obligation that it, it applies to local councils. Not that I'm advocating that that is what should be done, but it seems to be kind of... It mas well, as, as Keir Bloomer said, it seems to be masquerading as something that it, it, it clearly isn't and just simply requires a reporting uh, structure on local authorities who will then be free to continue doing what they're doing and, and leaving it in the too difficult box if that's what they're minded to do. So strong signal. So legislation uh, is important because it gives a strong signal about the Scotland that, that, that we seek. Uh, it gives a, a clarity of purpose and it is about increasing visibility of what we are collectively and individually doing and increases our accountability uh, for what we are, are doing. Um, I, I don't see anything pious or unworkable with that. And, you know, if Mr MacArthur has, um, I, I, at one point I was, in terms of his question, I was wondering if he was going to come forward with uh, further suggestions for, for future, um, you know, amendment and how to how strengthen the work. And we're always open uh, and, you know, welcoming of other ideas and other aspects uh, of, of, of the debate. But stage two, but I, I mean, I still need some convincing that what we're, what we're being asked to, to, to legislate here so is actually going to make didn't. a practical difference. You'd rather we, well, we didn't. I, didn't. I, I, you would rather that we didn't have duties uh, on ourselves as Scottish ministers and uh, on I would require government. No, I would rather we have duties that actually have a meaning, meaningful effect rather than a, a, a duty that allows us to say, look, we've put this into legislation, uh, haven't we done well? Um, and, and we are, as a parliament, I think, fairly guilty at, at not going back uh, and, and, and in terms of post-legislative scrutiny, seeing if it has the effect um, that we were anticipating. And my concern is here that, that what, we're, what we're proposing isn't necessarily going to have any marked uh, effect on the, on the behaviour of, of individual local authorities and simply creates a reporting requirement that will divert resource into preparing a report, which may be made to look very, very good, even if what's actually happened on the ground is, is, is no different from what it was uh, last year, 10 years ago, whatever. And, you know, there's a role for, for, for guidance to ensure that there is um, some comparisons in, in reports. There's no point people producing 32 uh, varieties of a report that can't be compared to, uh, you know, create that, that national picture. So the guidance in terms of ensuring that we have very purposeful uh, reports and that we're not just uh, getting on some uh, bureaucratic wheel is very important. But I think... Uh, in, in addition to the, the duty to uh, tackle inequality, uh, there is an action, and that action is that for Scottish ministers and local authorities that we have to report uh, every two years. Now, there may well be a debate whether that reporting cycle should be shorter uh, or, or longer. And uh, as a government, you know, we're, we're interested to hear uh, the arguments about that debate. Uh, but the fact that we are requiring ourselves and local authorities to report uh, on the progress, I think, is an action. There, of course, there are further actions on what you do uh, following up from, from that report. But if you are having to report every two years, um, you know, the government and local authorities are being held to account for what they've done 
in the past two years and for what they intend to do uh, in the next two years. And of course, local governments have that statutory responsibility uh, for uh, delivering uh, education. Um, and you know, I would contend uh, that you know the purpose uh, of the report and duties in particular is to enhance uh, visibility and accountability and to ensure that we do indeed act uh, on what the evidence tells us. Okay, sorry very much. Um, moving on, uh, Chick Brody. Good morning. I apologise for not being here when you arrived. Um, I wonder if I may address the schedule uh, which is introduced by Section 17 in terms of the increased uh, complaint availability to uh, children of proven capacity and, and you know, clearly the complaints they raise and it may go beyond that and, and we face Section 70 complaints. I mean, can I ask Cabinet Secretary, in, in terms of the S70, if uh, you believe this bill needs further clarification on the respective roles of the Scottish ministers and the additional uh, support needs tribunal for Scotland in dealing with what might be increased complaints? I mean, the intention is that there is no duplication or confusion between Section 70 complaints, uh, which um, can be raised, you know, with Scottish ministers in terms of where, um, well, not just an individual making a complaint, but, you know, whether it's a committee or a trade union or, you know, in response to a report where there's been a belief that um, a, a statutory responsibility has, has not been carried out. Um, so we have Section 70 complaints on the one hand, but you know there needs to be that clarity of purpose about the, the function of the additional support for needs uh, tribunal. Um, and you know it, it is not you know it is not right, I believe, that you know um, people can make a complaint that either goes down the Section 70 route first. Um, and then, you know, the additional support for needs tribunal, I mean, the route uh, for complaints um, or concerns and in relation to additional support for needs uh, or additional support for learning should be uh, down the additional support for needs tribunal, um, which, you know, we have uh, legislation on. Um, I believe the bill in terms of Section 4 um, is very clear. It has very uh, specific uh, restrictions. It's clearly stating um, what should be what types of issues should be going down the additional support for needs um, tri tribunal. So we don't want that duplication um, and we need that clarity uh, about you know, when issues should go down the additional support for needs tribunal and when something should be a section uh, 70 complaint. Um, we did consult uh, on this uh, back in December uh, 2013. We consulted on proposals to repeal uh, section 70, uh, but as a result of that, that, that consultation, um, there was a feeling that it was still considered to be important that there to be a role for ministers, but we don't want any uh, duplication or confusion between the role of ministers in terms of section 70 complaints uh, and the additional support for needs tribunal. Uh, you know, relating back to your predecessor in uh, some three years ago when uh, there were complaints about and about the confusion that existed. I wonder if I may just uh, move on to something else, because there is a, a stated period by which uh, complaints should be answered, yet the public sector ombudsman said, if I were a child or a parent uh, with a complaint, I would be confused about where I should go. That cannot be right. Either we have to be clear signposting about where to go for what, or to go for what, or we have to have a simplified system now, we just talked about, you know, a clearer process between Section 70 and complaints to the ASDNS. Um, what can we do to ensure, particularly children, and the, 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 the uh, emphasis seems to be on the, the, the right of the parents to make uh, the views known, but what can we do to ensure that we're children uh, who have ASN know where to go to make a complaint and ensure that we can fulfil the answers to that within the prescribed 112 days? 
Yeah. In, in terms of the issues about uh, children and their rights, I'm going to leave that to, to, to Dr Allen because I'm sure the convener doesn't want any duplication of, of, of evidence. Um, but where uh, I think uh, Mr Brodie uh, is, is correct is that you know, we always do need to strive for better uh, signposting. Um, I contend that um, with this bill that we do have a clarity about what is a Section 70 issue stroke complaint and what is the additional support for, for needs uh, issue um, or uh, complaint. But in terms of ensuring um, that uh, children and their families know uh, which is which, uh, that's an important point. Uh, we do, of course, have um, a code of practice around children's uh, learning. Uh, there are various materials that are produced by the Additional Support for Needs uh, Tribunal. Um, there's the National uh, Information and Advice Service through Inquire and also uh, Let's Talk. Um, but I, I think there is always scope uh, at a national and local level to ensure that, that signposting uh, is better. I'm certainly aware of that as a constituency MSP. A lot of my work... Uh, you know, in terms of my, my, my surgery work, when I meet parents uh, of children with additional support uh, for, for learning needs, is often signposting them uh, to, to the right process. And it does beg the question about how we can ensure parents at an earlier stage get that information um, more uh, routinely. Um, the issue about time skills is uh, important. And while, you know, there are not many uh, Section 70 complaints a few a year, um, the work that we did to analyse this, that between 2009 and 2012 showed that there was 20 uh, Section 70 complaints. The majority of them took over six months, and I think as a government we're seeing that that's uh, not good enough. Um, so therefore, you know, the bill is introducing the, the, the upper limit um, of 112 uh, work working days. Just one, one last yeah, question. Yeah, one quick one. Yeah, okay. Sorry, very quickly. Uh, which is a question I've just asked and asked in the previous uh, session. The, the, well, it's welcome that the, the amendments have been made so that the uh, children over 12 can, who have proven capacity can, can, answer, ask, can raise uh, complaints. Uh, that may cause conflict with parents. The question I asked the previous uh, witnesses was, who determines the parents' capacity? The preponderance seems to be in favour of the parents and yet, at the end of the day, the main user is the, is the child. There is nothing in the bill that I can see that determines how that situation is resolved. That is an important uh, point, convener, uh, and a very in interesting one. But I do think that's a matter for Dr Allen's evidence uh, later on. Thank you. Um, Colin, please. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we've uh, had a number of discussions on the role of the Chief Education Officer and we had in the previous panel quite a lively discussion with COSLA, who uh, are against it. Um, looking at uh, some of the issues that have arisen over this, comments such as the lack of formal consultation in advance of the, the bill's publication was cited, questions about staffing of local, local uh, authorities should be a matter for, for the local authority and not the government. There was concerns about who, who should carry out the post, what sort of qualifications. EIS said the CEO should be uh, GTCS registered. Well, East Lothian Council said it wasn't essential that the CEO even have an educational background, which is perhaps a little extreme. Um, but clearly there's a number of concerns about it, and uh, you know, I'd appreciate your views on that. Uh, yeah, um, Mr. Beat touches upon a, a number of um, important issues there. Um, I mean, as, as, as many members of this committee will know, I'm, I'm a former social worker, so I'm well acquainted with the responsibilities of the, the chief social work officer. Um, and, and if I can be, um, um, you know, completely upfront uh, with the committee, um, I'm was quite appalled uh, and quite shocked uh, to discover that the chief education officer rule um, had been uh, removed from statute um, over uh, 20 years ago. Now, 
the situation between the Chief Social Work Officer is not directly comparable uh, with a Chief Education Officer. There are some very, very specific statutory responsibilities that the Chief Social Work Officer has uh, over and above that of advising the local authority. But there are a number um, of roles in statute, um, what, what's called Head of Paid Service, which effectively is the Chief Executive Officer of the, the Council, Chief Exec. Uh, uh, statute also states that there needs to be uh, you know, a, a finance officer. We've got the chief social work officer uh, as uh, advised. And, you know, essentially for me, you know, over and above my shock uh, that uh, we didn't have chief education uh, officers in statute, there are three reasons uh, that I believe that there should be uh, a chief education officer. Um, one is that the landscape over the past 20 years for education departments, education services and local government as a whole <laughs> um, has changed quite uh, significantly. Uh, the way in which services are delivered, the way in which services uh, are integrated, um, much of that is positive. Uh, but as we heard from uh, the evidence, or I think it was the written evidence from the, the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, where they were pointing to uh, examples where a, not just a director, but a head of service uh, in terms of education was not someone from uh, an education background. And what I want to guard against is that becoming the norm, because I want to ensure that as part of the senior management team of education uh, of, ed, of an education service that there is indeed someone from an education background in terms of qualifications uh, and experiences um, you know there's a lot of money spent on education so that the voice of education should be heard when those decisions um, are being uh, enacted in terms of who uh, you know there will be full consultation uh, on the, the regulations that uh, describes that the, the qualifications uh, around the, the chief education uh, officer uh, full consultation um, 2016 for the act for that bit of the act to be implemented 2017 so i don't want to preempt that consultation uh, but i mean i do have to say to to committee that i am um minded along with the uh, teaching trade unions that within the senior management team of an education service there should indeed be someone who has experience um, of working with children teaching with children and who knows what it's actually like at the chalk face thank you some of the comments that have been made seem to indicate that uh, this is going to be necessarily an additional post do, would your view be that uh, this could, in fact, be carried out by an, an existing uh, member of staff? In the vast, vast majority of cases, it won't be an additional post because there will be uh, someone within the senior management team and an education service within a local authority uh, with the uh, appropriate level of experience and qualifications that matches the regulations that this parliament um, you know, will you know, collectively um, shape. But what I want to guard against, given that we have, you know, some examples, according to the Royal Society of Edinburgh, um, of someone being in charge of um, you know, an education service without the appropriate experience and qualification. And given that the landscape in local government and children's services and education services has changed and you know, will probably continue to change, you know, I want to ensure that for now and in the future, that we always have an appropriately qualified educationalist within that senior uh, education management team. And again, you know, I would hope that would be uh, welcomed uh, and be reassuring, uh, not least to parents amongst others. The bill uh, states that the CEO would advise the local authority. Do you envisage any role other than just advising? It, uh, I think guess what I'm saying here is advice sounds like a more passive role. Would that, would that post have any uh, proactive role in terms of ensuring that the advice given was actually carried out? 
I mean, the, the role would be advisory, but it's also about how um, local authorities discharge um, their legal duties, how they discharge uh, their functions and responsibilities, you know, whether that's in relation to um, additional support for needs legislation, whether it's to, you know, um, you know, uh, how good is your school, you know, school improvement inspections, uh, raising attainment, <laughs> you know, given the focus uh, that we across this parliament are having on closing the equity gap and raising attainment uh, for all children, uh, I think it's important that we have uh, an appropriately uh, qualified and experienced person within the, the, the management team. But there are other parts um, of um, the duties and responsibilities of a chief education officer that would be about, you know, um, overseeing, um, you know, the interaction with children's services general, about how we engage uh, with parents, you know, about how, um, you know, a counsellor is responding to, you know, the, the best research and, and, and evidence. So it would be wider than an advisory role because ultimately it's about how an authority discharges its various uh, roles and responsibilities and how those are implemented to the best effect for our children. Would you envisage the possibility that uh, this post could operate across more than one local authority boundary? In other words, it might take in two or three local authorities. Do you think that's feasible? I mean, the, the, the purpose of this part of the bill is not uh, in any shape or manner to restrict local authorities from making uh, decisions and choices as they see fit in and around uh, shared services. Uh, this is about ensuring that, you know, however that education service is configured, that there's someone uh, in the senior management team that knows what it's like in the chalk face. Following on from one of the questions that um, Colin Beattie just asked, the bill at the moment says that an education authority must appoint an officer to advise the authority. You know, you've, you've laid out your view on that. The evidence we got uh, in writing from ADES um, gives examples of the roles that ADES envisaged a chief education officer to undertake. It gives nine examples. The first one is to advise the education authority on matters relating to its statutory responsibilities. Fine. That seems to fit in with the, what it says in the bill in terms of the role being advisory. The other eight all say to, to ensure that, to ensure that, to ensure that. That doesn't sound like an advisory role. It sounds like a role where the, education, the chief education officer would have a role where, the, where they have a responsibility and an authority to ensure that something is done rather than advising some, the, the council that something should be done. Could you just clarify maybe whether, whether your view is, as per the bill, as it's mm -hmm. currently stated, or is it closer to what ADES have put in their evidence? I mean, this, this of course, is, is something that will have to be, you know, fleshed out in the regulations. But it is about, it's not just about advising, as intimated in my response to, to Mr Beattie, it is about ensuring that there is action and follow through from advice. But I would also stress that this isn't about the accountability of one person. This is about uh, increasing the, the accountability of the entire education system. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. I think it's an interesting line of question the, the convener. I mean, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you talked earlier on about um, not wanting to uh, second-guess the way in which um, local authorities uh, discharge their, their duties. But to some extent, having not identified a problem that exists at the moment, we do appear to be wading in with legislative levers to, to solve a problem that doesn't exist and are actually telling local authorities how it is that we expect them to discharge their, their, their duties and structure their organisation. I'm not telling local authorities how they should uh, structure uh, their organisations or uh, deliver uh, their, their services, but is it at the end of the day unreasonable to expect there to be someone within a senior management team uh, in an education service that uh, is appropriately uh, qualified and experienced. I think most uh, people, if you want to apply common sense, would expect there to be someone within that team who has first-hand experience uh, of education and that by de definition they are uh, an an educationalist. We know that there are many people that make up the, the breadth and strength of uh, any management team, uh, but surely to goodness uh, that having someone who is, uh, by definition, an expert in education, you know, has to also have a seat at that table. Do you expect the same requirement of 
the Scottish Government that in terms of the policy development within your own organisation, there would have to be a background in whether it be education or any other um, area of, of policy making? Well, I mean, I'll uh, restrict my remarks to education, if you don't mind. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, civil servants, in terms of Education Scotland, there is a, a variety of people from a variety of backgrounds, but of course uh, there are people who uh, are educationalists, um, and particularly when you look at, at Educational Scotland. I mean, there has to be that You'd be mix. trusted to take that advice and s secure that advice on the basis of what your requirements are. Um, and, and without the need to have a chief education officer within Scottish Government with a background and, and list of, 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 of experience that uh, needs to be kind of set down in, 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 in statute anyway. You can, you can be relied upon to secure that sort of um, advice and support um, of, of your own free will. I mean, if you have suggestions, uh, we'll you know, all, always look at them uh, fairly and squarely. No, I'm just, I'm, but, but, I'm just but, saying in terms saying, of partnership but, but relationship but between yourself and local authorities point, yeah, but the to be rather different. Is, the difference is local authorities, as things stand, have the legal responsibility, mm -hmm. they have the operational responsibility to uh, deliver uh, education. And I've been entirely candid and upfront uh, with committee uh, as a former social worker. I'm well appraised of the role and responsibilities of the chief social work mm -hmm. officer and I was shocked uh, that we no longer have provision to ensure uh, that each and every local authority has a chief educational officer. I think it's pragmatic and sensible. It came as a shock to you because presumably you hadn't identified a problem that had arisen from the fact that there wasn't a requirement in statute that local authorities had in fact been discharging their duties of, uh, uh, of educational provision without the requirement for a chief education officer to be written into statute. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was when I became uh, Education Secretary uh, and was immediately uh, appraised of the situation uh, and being candid, and I'm telling you that I was shocked. I've been educated. You've been I'm an, an MSP since 2007. I mean, yeah, there are a range of issues. issues. There are a range, so, yeah, sorry, dealt with a range Liam, of issues. Just I think we've, I think we've done that one. You know, I think you know. I want to move on. Time is tight. I, I don't want to start a spat between members and the cabinet secretary uh, when we have short of time. Um, Mary Scanlon. Um, the next uh, issue is um, uh, registration of independent schools. Uh, the policy memorandum says there's a clear relationship between poor teacher quality and weaknesses in the provision of education. So, can I ask the cabinet secretary why was there no consultation? undertaken uh, on this uh, issue in advance of the Bill's publication, and what was the driver for the legal requirement that all teachers have to be GTCS registered? Well, of course, there uh, was a consultation. There was very um, specific uh, consultation uh, with uh, the, the sector. I mean, there wasn't widespread uh, consultation, but I mean, of course, the government uh, has been in um, discussions with the, the seven uh, grant aided uh, special schools, uh, the GTCS, uh, and of course, SCIS, the, the Scottish Council uh, for Independent uh, Schools. Um, this is an issue that we've been, uh, that the, the sector has been working with the government on for 15 years. Um, in terms of the um, evidence, you know, you can look at a wealth of evidence uh, in terms, you know, from people like the, the, the OECD uh, that talks about um, teachers having the most direct influence on student performance uh, and on improving uh, learning uh, outcomes. There is a, a consensus in the literature uh, that teacher quality uh, is the most important school variable influencing uh, student uh, achievements, and that comes from uh, PISA uh, 2012. Uh, and again, you know, I think um, it is a, a desirable thing that when you consider our education system uh, as, as a whole, uh, that teachers uh, are, are registered. And one of the, the strengths of the Scottish education system, certainly within the state sector, is that uh, we have a, a graduate teaching workforce, uh, that our teachers have a teaching qualification and that they are registered. And the issue in and around registration is that teaching is a learning profession uh, and therefore you know, teachers you know, are subject to continuous professional development and uh, the, the, the professional um, update uh, process. 
Uh, my question was about poor teacher quality, but we'll, we'll move on uh, from there. Uh, my next question is, um, you've uh, notified the committee today that there'll be a requirement for head teachers to hold a, a standard for headship. So this again would be a Scottish qualification. We heard last week um, from uh, several witnesses that highly qualified and highly experienced teachers coming up from England had to wait some nine months and more in order to get through the, the GTC. So, you know, uh, what I'm asking is this registration, you know, for people, let's just say, coming from England in terms of teachers coming to Scotland to teach, but also for this new Scottish qualification for headship, uh, anyone coming from England would be unlikely to have the Scottish headship qualification, just as they would be unlikely to be registered with the GTCS. You know, does this fulfil... Uh, European free movement of, of people, because my understanding is that a qualification in England or Scotland would mean you could go and teach in France or Germany. So why is it so difficult for a teacher to come from England to Scotland? Why is there such, such a delay? And, you know, I'm just really the head teachers. I'm thinking about schools like Gordonston that take pupils from all over the world and they're a very high employer in the Murray, a large employer in the Murray constituency, but it seems that they can only get a head teacher who would have a Scottish qualification. And in terms of, um, as we move forward and introduce the, the mandatory head teacher qualification, um, the GTCS, um, you know, uh, could um, and would um, ensure that there was um, equivalency uh, processes so they would look for uh, what was you know equivalent to that because you know of course that if we introduce um, you know specific qualifications for head teachers um, in Scotland and you know that head teachers coming from out with won't necessarily have those qualifications so you would have to look uh, at um, some sort of um, equivalency um, and the GTCS uh, will, will take that, that forward. Um, Mrs Scanlon touches upon the issue of um, teacher shortages in some subjects and some you know, par parts of the country um, and there's a range of actions you know, undergoing to address that. Um, so in terms of GTCS registration and how uh, that process has improved, that is just one you know, aspect of that overall work uh, to address the, the, the issues that Mary Scanlon uh, raises. But it is important to, to recognise that um, the GTCS you know, last year registered over 500 teachers and that nearly half of them were uh, from uh, England. Uh, and of course, and I think that uh, Ken Muir has evidence that he gave to committee, you know, if there are ways in which uh, to ensure, you know, better processes uh, that don't dilute standards, well, of course, we're always open to, you know, improve, improving the processes uh, around these matters. So, uh, well, I'm pleased to hear that an equivalency will apply to the headship uh, if someone has an equivalent qualification in England, let's say, that they will be able to apply for a post in Scotland. So why doesn't the same equivalency apply to teachers who are qualified to teach in England and uh, in Murray again, there, are, there was an example, teachers who are qualified and experienced teachers in England come to Scotland, perhaps just for a short time. Why do we not have the same equivalency uh, there um, in terms of transferring teachers here? I mean, given, given the shortages. I, I mean, I think the GTCS spoke in detail at your last committee uh, Meeting around this, and they do well, and they, 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 and they, takes do, a have, long they, do, time. they do have processes. Well, not not always, um, but you know some of the issues for people who are employed as teachers uh, south of the border is the fact that they you know don't always uh, have a teaching qualification. Um, and you know ag again, you know looking at some of the evidence that the committee had last week, where there was the suggestion uh, that MSPs would be suitable people to teach modern stuff. Um, I beg to differ uh, about that strongly. It's not that uh, you know, <laughs> you know, people who, for example, teach uh, 
you know, who are immensely talented musicians can, of course, you know, have an input in schools, but that doesn't mean they're well prepared to take a young person through their higher music. And I don't know many MSPs that would be well qualified to take a young person through their higher modern studies. So, you know, it is a strength of our system that we expect teachers not only to have a degree, but we expect them to have a teaching qualification. Um, that is not uh, unreasonable, uh, far, far uh, from it. So there are issues for some teachers uh, coming from elsewhere uh, where we have to um, look closely at whether or not they have a teaching qualification and what qualifications um, they, they, they do have. There are ways in which people can uh, top up uh, their qualifications um, and the GTCS um, has done a lot of work with the University of Northampton uh, and the University of uh, Buckingham uh, with regards to that. There are also aptitude uh, tests as well that, that are currently used where it's difficult to get that equivalency of, of, of qualifications. Not all teachers in further education are GTCS registered. Does that uh, mean there's poor teacher quality there? And university lecturers, none of them are GTCS trained or registered. Uh, so are there issues in further and higher education as well? Um, we're talking about children and our children's uh, education and our strength uh, of how we teach children in Scotland is that we have a graduate workforce, we have teachers that are qualified to teach because the teaching bit is not the easy bit by any stretch uh, of uh, the, 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 imag the imagination. And if Mrs Scanlon has proposals in terms of the registration of uh, you know, further education or uh, university lecturers, well, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see them, but we're commission. talking about children. Yeah, I'm talking about people. children too, but the Wood Commission does look at children mm. 14 and over possibly going to further education and <coughs> FE lecturers coming into schools. And as an FE lecturer for two decades before coming in here, uh, I was never GTCS registered and uh, I don't think anyone complained about my teaching abilities or quality uh, um, in that sense. So I'm just trying to, I think, uh, Liam MacArthur raised earlier, looking for a problem. We have a solution, but I'm uh, looking for the, uh, the problem here and just trying to be consistent. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the fact that we have a, 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 a graduate, uh, graduate workforce, uh, workforce, teaching workforce with teaching qualifications and that are registered uh, doesn't remove all problems, but it certainly, I would contend, uh, minimises uh, problems. In terms of the, the young workforce uh, agenda, uh, absolutely there is uh, scope for better collaboration uh, between schools and uh, colleges. Uh, we do indeed, you know, as happens in my, my own constituency, young people go uh, and receive part uh, of their, their education in college if they're doing a, a vocational course. Um, you know, that is uh, right and proper, but in terms of teachers who are teaching to the curriculum and uh, you know supporting young people through uh, national qualifications uh, I'm going to stick to my guns thanks very much uh, you know we expect our teachers uh, to have a teaching qualification and to be registered and that should apply throughout the education system thank you, much, thank you. Uh, finally uh, Gordon MacDonald very quick question just to clear something up from last week um, we, we heard in evidence that um, the vast majority of teachers in Scotland were uh, GTCES registered and that included over 90% of um, teachers in the private independent sector. Um, are you satisfied that the working group that has been set up between the Scottish Council of Independent Schools and the GTCES um, will be able to address all the concerns uh, raised by the sector regarding the small number of teachers who aren't GTCS registered? Um, my recollection of the statistics convener is that there are over 4,000 teachers in the independent sector. There are currently, in terms of the most up-to-date information, 645 that are not registered. Um, 265 of those would, in terms of the information we currently have, would be likely to meet uh, registration. There's an issue about um, music teachers, uh, there's 115 of them um, who tend to be uh, instrumental instructors and you know, the GTCS, as they said in their evidence to committee, are looking at 
whether registration is appropriate uh, or not. And then there, there's a, an issue over, uh, I think, a remaining 265 people who have a range uh, of qualifications, not all degree qualified, not all uh, with teaching qualifications. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a range of, of, of options. But we work very hard uh, with the, the sector to, to, to reach, you know, uh, pragmatic conclusions. What about the, um, the likes of the, the specialist schools, like the Steiner schools, or, for that matter, the... In, the uh, international school in Aberdeen, where they might not necessarily teach the Scottish curriculum. And I think certainly for those smaller schools like uh, Steiner uh, and the international school in, in, in Aberdeen, um, we can see that registration would be more of a challenge uh, for, for those schools. So we want to find uh, solutions uh, that you know, will be helpful, but solutions without uh, the dilution of, of standards. And in terms of the grant aid specialist schools, I think there's only two teachers across the seven schools that are not, not registered. OK, um, that ends the questions uh, for this morning to the Cabinet Secretary and her officials. Can I thank you all very much for your attendance this morning? Um, uh, thank you for giving your time uh, to come to committee. Um, I'm going to suspend briefly to allow the panel to change over. Thank you. Can I welcome to committee um, this afternoon um, Alistair Allen, Minister for Learning, Science and Scotland's Languages and his accompanying officials. Um, as we said earlier, um, uh, Mr Allen is here to, uh, sorry, Dr Allen, I do apologise, Dr Allen. Dr Allen is here to answer questions on the Gaelic uh, section of the bill and indeed the additional support needs part of the bill. Uh, I'm going to move straight to questions. Uh, Minister, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, we heard evidence in the first session from COSLA that um, they thought there was going to be difficulties um, because there was a lack of available Gaelic language teachers and in their view there was a lack of new Scottish Government funding for this process. In addition, last week um, Margaret Wentworth said that parents needed a process because some local authorities are not supportive it was also suggested that a list of factors in Section 10 might be used as an excuse not to do anything. So my question is really, 
will this bill actually achieve anything? Will it actually uh, encourage more local authorities to actually provide Gaelic medium primary education, uh, or is it just about expanding the existing provision? Well, there's a list of very good questions there. I'll, I'll do my best to, to work my way through them, convener. Uh, in terms of your, your final point there, is it about uh, um, uh, ex is it about developing Gaelic medium education or, or just making it bigger? I suppose the two things are, are interconnected. Obviously, the 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 size of, of the, the numbers of uh, going through Gaelic medium primary, particular, has been increasing in recent years, and that's uh, part of a very deliberate effort. Uh, Obviously, people will know my strong views about maintaining the existence of the Gaelic language. The limiting factor on it is the one which uh, I'm sure you'll have identified, which is uh, the uh, number of available teachers. That likewise is something which the, the Scottish Government and Borna Gaelic are working with, uh, and have increased the numbers coming through uh, in this year um, uh, quite significantly, up to, doesn't sound like a big number, but 28 coming out of uh, the teacher training course. I think the points about how strong is the bill, how, how workable is the bill, or the, the bit of the bill that relates to Gaelic uh, medium education, I think there is a balance to be struck here. We've been talking about uh, a right to primary Gaelic medium education for quite a long time in Scotland. I, I can remember this, 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 this concept of, of reasonable demand and, uh, and the need for a right being talked about for a long time. I have uh, been involved and the government have been involved in coming up with a bill which we think is reasonable, reasonably balanced in the sense that it provides people uh, with a process, uh, it provides them with something uh, approaching the entitlement we've all been talking about, um, but an entitlement to something which exists rather than an entitlement to something that, that doesn't exist. All of that said, uh, I am very willing, and I'm happy to indicate here today, that I am willing to listen to those voices who would like uh, the government to go further. I'm willing to, to listen to what they have to say uh, about the, the concept of entitlement and how that might be strengthened in the bill. It is a balancing act, but I am more than willing today to talk about that and to, to hear about people's views on it. You've talked about this balancing act and that it's, a, you know, it's about reason, a reasonable demand but given the concerns that I read out to you from Margaret Wentworth, should it be a more of a, a legal right within uh, the bill for Gaelic medi medium education, or you know, is that not your view? Well, the, the focus of this part of the bill is on having the right to uh, a process, if you like, a right to having the demand for, for Gaelic medium education within a community assessed. I think the, the question, if I recall correctly, that Ms Wentworth and others were raising was what happens at the end of that process? What, what is the entitlement at the end of that process? Now, there's been much discussion of this uh, online. There's been much discussion of this within the Gaelic world. Uh, as I've indicated, I am, I am willing to, to listen, if I can, to this, to respond to this as much as I can. Uh, and if there are ways forward that we can work together on that, I'm happy to, to try to do that. It's not an open-ended commitment, as I say. We can't. There's no, there is little point in creating a, an entitlement to, to things that don't exist. But I think that working together, we may be able to find a way to strengthen parts of this bill. You mentioned, I think you you mentioned section 10. Uh, section 10 deals uh, in part with that, I think, but in part also, uh, I may be corrected, uh, with the the kind of um, uh, reasons which uh, which local authorities can can produce for for. Uh, uh, for counting against, uh, if you like, uh, um, Gaelic or the, 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 the case for provision of Gaelic medium education uh, being put forward by parents. And again, this is something that I'm sure that I'll be able to, to work with the Gaelic community on. In, in, in the previous panel, uh, Addis highlighted that the educational focus was on 3 to 18 learning. And given that there are nearly 4,000 secondary pu pupils either in Gaelic medium education or in Gaelic learning classes, is the government considering extending the bill to include secondary education? Well, th there's no doubt that uh, for Gaelic medium education to be a success in the future, we do have to look to where secondary fits into that. There is, however, and you've mentioned it yourself, a very important distinction to be made here between uh, people who are learning Gaelic and people who are learning in Gaelic. 
Um, and obviously the bill deals with, uh, with children who are learning in Gaelic. Uh, that is at the moment predominantly a feature of, uh, of primary school. That's why the, the, the bill deals with that primarily. There are powers in it uh, to, to deal with potentially in the future preschool. Um, but the, uh, the, the focus is very much on primary, as that, that is where the focus of, of Gaelic medium education has been to date. But yes, I would like to see more schools uh, develop more courses available through the medium of Gaelic at secondary. Uh, that really does, however, depend on us having uh, secondary teachers who are able and qualified to teach through the medium of Gaelic. And I would not like to give this committee any false impression of how many of those there are. Okay. My final question is just, previous Gaelic bills ha have arrested the decline in the language. Um, do you see this bill helping to restore the levels of Gaelic speakers back to the 2001 level? Well, that, that is the, the target that we have set ourselves as a government. And uh, it sounds very modest to try and get back to the, the level of Gaelic speakers that there were in 2001. Uh, until you, you consider that the, every census, bar I think one or two flukes in the 1890s and the 1970s from memory, every single census in the last 100, 150 years has shown a decline. Um, what we have managed to do in the last census is essentially overall the number of Gaelic speakers that the decline has been almost arrested. Uh, now we have to try and get back to the number of, of Gaelic speakers there were in 2001. Why do I say that? Because unless we can do that, then the trajectory uh, is not that of a healthy, thriving language. Uh, we do need to, to get back to those figures. A, a lot has been done on that front. Borna Gaelic have been tasked very specifically with that. Um, the, the increase in the, the numbers coming through Gaelic medium education is part of that. This bill is part of that. But also part of that is the role of Gaelic in the community as well. And we mustn't gain the impression that that Gaelic is something that happens in school and nowhere else. OK, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thanks. I think most people recognise that what we have here is the balancing between an outright right to Gaelic medium primary education and uh, the demand that exists. And you've said that you're open to strengthening the legislation. I wonder if you'd be open, and, um, open to an amendment in Section 11 of the bill um, to allow for a, an appeal by parents um, where local authorities have decided um, against providing uh, Gaelic medium education? Well, my, my impressions, my, my initial reaction to that would be that I think creating an appeal structure into this would, would be a, a fairly disproportionate and complex thing to introduce. Uh, I think perhaps... Uh, what others have been pointing to here is, is the question of what happens at the end of the assessment process. I think if there's room for us to strengthen the bill, uh, it more centres around questions like uh, what happens at the, the end of the assessment process uh, and also what are the kind of reasons that local authorities can, can give uh, um, against, if you like, the, the creation of, of, of a Gaelic medium unit. I think those are more proportionate ways to, to strengthen the bill, but if people have specific proposals, I'm, I'm more than happy to listen to them. Okay. Yes. On that point, um, the SNP manifesto in 2007 and 11 uh, stated that there would be an entitlement to Gaelic medium education, and given that 11 out of 23 sections in the bill is on Gaelic, you know, there's, there's plenty of room for it. So why did an entitlement to Gaelic medium education become an entitlement for parental requests to be processed in a consistent manner? And I just wonder, you keep saying, and in Angus MacDonald's members' business, you also said if members want to come and talk to you and you will listen and the bill can be strengthened, you know. So given the history of this so far, when you say you're willing to strengthen the bill, will you go back to honouring your manifesto commitments in 2007 and 11? Well, the first thing to be said in answer to that is that uh, to create any kind of entitlement, wherever on the spectrum of entitlements that is, there does have to be a process. There does have to be some kind of process introduced through this bill to, to measure demand, 
uh, to measure the need that there is in community and to measure the extent to which a local authority is, is willing and able to engage with that. So uh, I, I don't think there's any need for me to apologise for the fact that, that there is a, a process introduced in the bill. I understand the point the member is making, and I've, I've already referred to it, which is around what happens at the end of this process. Uh, to what degree is there entitlement uh, to see that go a step further at the end of the, 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 the assessment of the need? So I think, as, as, as is said in Gaelic, we may all be on the same oar, if I can use that analogy. Uh, I think, to some degree, we're all pointing in the same direction. There may be opportunities at that point in the bill uh, which go further along the line of entitlement, as the member alludes to. But this process is, a, you know, it's, ju it's just see seeing the administrative means of processing a parental request. So it could be, for example, we heard from Borders this morning, so that process can be, well, you know, your demand for, uh, for Borders Council to provide Gaelic is, is not reasonable or, you know, we can't afford it. So, I mean, it's just a process. It's an administrative process. It's not an administrative... Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you saying it's this process will lead to an increase in the demand for Gaelic and this is the... And in a year or maybe in, when we come back in September, that this process is 50% of the way to the entitlement... I mean, it's not a process, it's not a pro we know what the demand is for Gaelic. We've got more information from the census. We've heard Gordon MacDonald giving the figures for Gaelic education, the increase in demand and increase in supply, indeed, in recent years. So we know the demand is there. I'm trying to understand why an entitlement to Gaelic education, medium education, becomes an entitlement to a process. With respect, while I agree with what's said about the demand for, for Gallup medium education nationally, one of the, the obstacles that's certainly been suggested to me by, by communities looking for Gallup medium education in their community uh, is that there isn't an easily demonstrable uh, way of showing what demand is locally. There isn't a formal means by which local authorities have to, have to see and acknowledge and accept what demand is locally. There isn't a means of putting that in the public record. I think most people campaigning for Gallic medium education would see that as strengthening their hand within the community and strengthening their hand with the, the, the local uh, authority. As I've said a few times now, uh, and I, I appreciate the, the, the motives behind the member's point because I understand our, our commitment to this, I think there is room for us to look at what happens at the end of that process to see if it can be strengthened further. Do you promise the entitlement and you've got a majority no, government, and you can bring forward that entitlement, but instead it becomes an administrative process. Well, because as, as so I've why promise it and then... As, as I've indicated to, to the committee, uh, I, I don't think there's, there's much dispute on the fact that I would like to see a, a fairly dramatic increase in the, uh, the scale of, of uh, Gallant medium education in Scotland. Indeed, there has to be that to happen uh, for the language to survive and flourish in the future. What we have to do in legislation, however, is try to uh, make sure that what we do uh, actually leads somewhere. It, it has to be more than a slogan. It has to be a right to something that's going to happen. It has to be a right to something that we have the means uh, and the teachers, crucially amongst that, uh, to provide. Now, there are lots of things that are happening on, on the front of providing more teachers and keeping up with demand, but I would be... For instance, if you, if you look at, uh, as, as you have looked at the evidence that, that was received, much of it, I'm very pleased to say, has been looking for the bill to go uh, that bit further. The demand has been there to see uh, Gaelic medium uh, education increase. Some of the evidence, however, has been from uh, COSLA suggesting the bill goes too far. I think there is a question of proportionality, but I want to listen. I want to see if there's room to strengthen the bill. MacArthur. I'm no expert oarsman, but if everybody's on the same oar, do we not just end up going around in circles? Um, the, uh, the point I was going to make was uh, you, you, you suggest that you're open to ideas about how we might go further. Um, I, I think I've put on record before that I'm very supportive of the, the work you've been doing in relation to supporting 
um, the development and promotion of Scots language, and therefore for areas like Orkney Shetland, we heard from um, Borders Council this morning, a similar concern in areas where there isn't really a tradition in Gaelic speaking, there may be traditions of, of, of other language teaching. I, I think I would be looking for an insurance here that, you, that you're not minded to go down the route of putting in place a bill that could have the consequences of, of diverting resource away from the work that's going on to support language development and promotion of Scots language and dialect in order to, in a sense, um, uh, promote Gaelic where there hasn't really been that tradition in the past. Uh, th this uh, bill isn't about uh, forcing local authorities, uh, as it were, to, to provide Gaelic. But I think, uh, uh, in a way, if, if there is no demand for Gaelic medium within a local community, then there will be nobody making use of this bill. Um, uh, what I think this bill does do, however, is it, it provides a, a mechanism um, for communities where there is a demand for, for Gaelic medium education uh, to, to put that forward. In terms of resources, uh, no, I, I, I agree with the, the member. I, I agree that, um, the, uh, that there is a need to ensure that the Scots language, which you'll know as well I've been very involved in, uh, is promoted. Uh, the, prom the appointment of Scots language coordinators in schools, which includes both an Orcadian and a Shetlander, uh, does indicate the, the need that there is to um, uh, explain and promote that linguistic tradition in Scotland as well. Thank you. Uh, Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to ask some questions around the additional support needs. Um, written submissions from organisations have welcomed the principle of extending the um, ASL rights to children and the introduction of support services. However, there's been a number of criticisms, in particular that the definition of capacity should be aligned with that in existing legislation. Um, so, i.e. that a child, a child of 12 or over is presumed to have capacity and a child under 12 could potentially have capacity. We've also heard that the definition of capacity, capacity may not be compatible with the UN conventions. We heard that in evidence um, a few weeks ago on the rights of the child and rights of persons with disabilities. So why the standard principle there on capacity wasn't applied in this instance, Minister? Well, the, the issue of, of capacity, as, as, as you indicate, is a, a, a very important one and by no means a simple one in this piece of legislation. Uh, if we had uh, gone down uh, the route, for instance, of uh, presuming capacity, as, as, as you've indicated, was, was one way forward, uh, that would have had, I think, a whole range of, of unintended consequences, potentially. Um, there are issues, wider issues as well, about the use of, of rights. Um, uh, we, the very purpose of this legislation is obviously to uh, increase young people's rights. But th this is no simple piece of legislation because it refers back to the, the 2004 legislation, which, for instance, uh, includes, and I'm not going to sit and list them unless members want me to, some, some 18 potential scenarios uh, around the use of those rights. There is also a, a question uh, about ensuring that, that we uh, have, have situations which, or that we do not rather have situations which put children uh, in a particularly difficult situation. Uh, for instance, rights have not been extended uh, around the issue of school placement requests, which could, could lead in some situations um, to, to children and young people uh, seeking uh, essentially uh, to not just to be removed from their family, but from their community or even country. So it's by no means simple, um, but as I say, it refers back to a piece of legislation which is by no means simple. Um, there are simpler solutions which could have been found. Um, you, you point to one of them. I am not, however, convinced that that would have been the best solution of, in the best interests of, of young people. Well, as I've indicated, and uh, I, I mean, I can mention, for instance, um, some of the, the scenarios that we're talking about. Um, for instance, the, we're talking about things like requests for assessment of additional support needs, making the formal uh, uh, request for the assessment, taking part in the assessment process, um, agreeing information about what can be shared in order to support transition planning, requesting a coordinated support plan or requesting a review of that plan, applying to independent, independent adjudication or making a reference to the additional support needs tribunals. The, these are a whole series of scenarios um, some of which, as I say, uh, 
the, 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 you're suggesting that a, 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 a presumed consent could have been uh, used for all of these, uh, but I, I, would, I would take the view that if that line had been taken, there would be unintended consequences in several of the, the areas I've just mentioned. Uh, with the convener's permission, uh, can I ask if uh, you're, Laura, able to, to talk a wee bit more about some of those scenarios? Absolutely. Um, I think the, when we were developing the, um, the proposals for this um, amendment to this legislation, we started from a slightly different position, which was what does the child have to do in order to access their rights? And we worked that way forward. So we mapped the processes that the child would have to use and what support would be required to, to use them. Part of that consideration, right from the start, it became apparent that capacity and best interest was going to be a significant part um, and concern around um, this extension. Therefore, we, we've taken a, a, a slightly different approach from, from um, the approach suggested by Ian Smith, um, which was to um, produce, include safeguards to enable um, us for parents and, and others to check that the child is able to use their rights and that the use of those rights are, are in um, their best interest. I think, in, as Dr Allen has said, that's in recognition of the fact that there are, eight, there are at least 18 different rights and therefore 18 different assessments of capacity depending on the process that the child will go through, um, which makes it very, very complex. Um, and therefore, the presumption of capacity in relation to those rights may not be appropriate. We don't want to end up with a situation, or we're trying to avoid the situation, where we give a child rights, and as a result of them using the rights, they actually come under pressure and are unable to cope with the process that, that they're actually going through. The, the example that Dr Allen gave of assessment is probably a very good one, um, in that the child would then have to would have to go through the process of assessment, but actually receive their diagnosis, for example, themselves. And, and so are they able to cope with that? Or do they understand what that means for them as part of that process? And I, I think on balance, we felt that, that if we were to, to go for a, a presumption, we would p be potentially um, causing harm to children, and that wasn't what we wanted. Therefore, we took um, a different approach, which was around a an assessment of capacity and then an assessment of best interest, and, and that was the reason for it. Come back to the, the best interest test, in particular the Ian Smith thing um, that you brought up, Ms Meagle, but I just wanted to go back to the capacity part, um, you've answered the main parts of it, but the UN conventions then, do you see it as against that or, or it will be compatible? Uh, no, I don't accept the, the suggestion that's been put that it's incompatible, uh, and I think one of the reasons why I'm, I'm confident of that is because, uh, for instance, the, um, the entitlement here uh, is for for all children to uh, have the, their needs assessed. Uh, obviously, only those uh, young people who's, uh, um, who are assessed as having additional support needs uh, will then go on to use some of those rights. But I'm confident, that, not least, as I say, because of the fact that the right exists for all young people to have uh, their needs assessed, I, I believe it's something that's uh, equitable to all young people. OK, thank you. Um, you may be aware of the Govan Law Centre's um, criticisms of the best interest test and again it goes on to Ian Smith's and, and the interpretation of um, Ms. Michael, your quote that you gave us and I remember the exchange that we had and, and evidence that we had from those bodies they said and it's their words not mine but that you may have misunderstood um, the, the best interests. The Government Law Centre said if a child has legal capacity to exercise their rights then it is for them to determine whether it's in their best interest to do so. This is the part of what it means to have right in um, deciding whether and how to use them. What's the view on that? Obviously, I'm talking, um, but Minister, if, if you wish as well, but just on the simple basis that Government Law Centre say um, clearly we're not meeting the test of best interest and also on evidence we have heard that government officials might not be interpreting it in the best way. Yes, um, I think that... Um in principle, I understand the argument that if you give someone, um, give a child a right, that they then should be able to exercise that right or not, um, and that that is that's um, the end of the matter. Um, for this group of children and young people, recognising that it's a very, very broad spectrum of, of differing adif additional support needs, and as I said, going through the processes that that we. Um, would require them to undertake in order to access those rights, we then introduced 
um, the best interests um, element. I recognise that it's a departure, um, but firmly believe that um, the, the fact that it then allows an access to an appeal for parents um, in particular um, to make sure that the, the um, rights are being used in, in the best interests of their child. I gave, I gave the example at the time um, of where a child, for very good reasons in their own right, would want to remove part of the provision that, that's there for their, to meet their assessed needs. Um, I think that that's, that stands. It, it comes from the process of working through what would be required to do their, to, in order to use their rights. I recognise that others view that as a barrier to those rights. Um, for us, we would view this as a safeguard to make sure that we're not putting children in, into difficult situations. Um, but I do absolutely recognise that there are it's two different perspectives on the same issue. I think to, to pick up on that uh, again as well, I think the, the existence of the, the right to appeals acts as an important backstop. Um, but I think there's also an, uh, I think there's an important um, uh, feature, which is the fact that obviously uh, through guidance. Uh, Local authorities are assessing capacity. They have to. They can't do so within a vacuum. They have to do so uh, within uh, rules that are laid down. And as I say, I believe that the existence of, of a, a right to an appeal does act as an important, uh, an important feature, an important backstop to, to, to help uh, bolster rights in that area too. I mean, obviously, you, you've said how complicated this issue is and the tests that are applied, and um, and I, I completely understand that. So therefore. Are the local authorities the best place organisation to deal with the issues of best interest and capacity, given that the young people that might be exercising those rights are doing so against that local authority? I mean, I have, give, I have asked COSLA for their opinion, but they don't seem to have one, which is quite bizarre on this. Um, they usually have an opinion, uh, COSLA. I've found uh, they, they usually have a very well-informed opinion, and perhaps it's relevant to say that because... Uh, I think in this instance, local authorities are in a position to be well informed, um, not just about children's rights, but also about the, the services that, that uh, children uh, would be making use of. Uh, and it may be in some cases that it's possible to uh, have a dialogue with a young person who has a relationship with somebody who works for the council as well. So notwithstanding everything I've said about the kind of objective uh, uh, parameters within which uh, local authorities will have to work when they're doing these assessments. I think they're best placed and have the relationships in place to, to carry these assessments out. Thank you. Uh, final question from Chick Brody. We're talking about the assessment of children's needs and uh, where they fall in the spectrum of demonstrating they've got capacity. And of course, we've extended that in terms of a question I've asked in the previous session session before that last week is we wish to avoid conflict of interest with parents of course but who assesses the parents capacity to address the issues I mean, the children raises an issue uh, and it exercises its rights and has the capacity to exercise its right which doesn't necessarily meet the requirements as the parents um, think they should who assesses the parent? Well, I suppose you, you point an important uh, area around why we're having this piece of legislation, which is that there are um, parents who, in most cases through, through no fault of their own, are, are not in a, a position um, to, to stand up for their children's interests. As things currently stand under the Additional Support for Learning Act, um, there is no requirement uh, of assessment of parental capacity. So there's no uh, body identified to, to assess this, uh, and instead the Act requires that parents or carers act on their child's behalf. Now, as I've said, um, part of the, the, the burden of this, this piece of legislation, part of the reasoning behind it, is that there are circumstances in which parents don't do that. So the, the bill itself, or this part of the bill, is intended to fill some of those gaps. But it is a problem. In current legislation, it is. I can, with convener's permission, yeah. call upon Laura Meekle to say more on that. I mean, I think there are circumstances where, um, where as a result of capacity, parents may not be able to um, act on, on their children's behalf. And you ask about who makes that assessment. Um, those are the types of matters that would be considered, um, for example, in relation to other matters around children's hearings um, and um, around social work services, so that it wouldn't fall... 
um, particularly to the Education Authority to make that, that type of consideration as part of the additional support for learning framework, um, particularly. I'm not sure if that's helpful. Well, it is helpful, but it, it still doesn't fill the black hole that, that might arise. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, it's the children's rights and needs and where they want to go that I'm sure we, and, and what the bill wants to do is to protect. Uh, you, you rightly point to, to these problems. I think the fact that uh, the bill seeks to, to extend rights to, to an older uh, uh, group of children with, with or young people with capacity is an attempt to, and I believe a, quite a far-reaching attempt to address some of those concerns. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Can I thank you and your officials for attending this morning? But can I ask you to just stay in place for one moment while we deal with the next uh, item business, which will be fairly quick, I hope. Our next item is to consider three pieces of subordinate legislation um, as they are uh, listed on the agenda. Do members have any comments they wish to make on any of these instruments? No? No comments. Uh, therefore, the question is, does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instruments? That's agreed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as the committee has agreed to hold the next items in private, I now close the meeting to the public. Thank you.